This is a live mic check. One, two, three, four, five. Second live mic check, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We're on the air. All right. All right. This is the September 4th meeting of the County Blackport Planning Board, and welcome. Uh, we have two that we know are missing, and one is uh, Neil and Nina are not going to be here this evening. Uh, I saw, George, saw Larry earlier in the day, so he'll be here, probably make a grand entrance in a little while. In the meantime, we have... We have the other members, and of course, you, George, will be voting this this evening, as as will Larry, assuming he does in fact show up. So, all right, the minutes. Now, I I found one correction, which I'm sure has been made. Uh, any, any other problems? No. no. Okay. So I'll have to take a motion to approve. Same. I move to accept the minutes. Okay. Second. In favor? Okay. All right. Which brings us to our agenda. And the first thing on the agenda is the 
Item 190701, Kenny Bunkport Conservation Trust, Richardson and Associates Authorized Agent. It is a public hearing for approval to create a nature park and preserve with new trails and a new and a welcome hut on Mills Road. And uh, why don't you proceed? Thank you. And here's Larry. Why don't you let Larry okay. position himself? First, I will <laughs> recede. <laughs> so I told him it was going to be a dramatic entrance, folks. Here he is. The deciding vote. Just have a seat. All right. Okay, go ahead. Proceed. I'm sorry. Hello. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Robert Massengale. I'm a landscape architect and project manager with Richardson Associates, as uh, Tom had indicated. And I'm here speaking tonight on behalf of the Kennebunkport Conservation Trust and the Meadowwoods Preserve Executive Committee to uh, go over our site plan for the Meadowwoods Reserve or Preserve. Um, what I'd like to do this evening uh, for the benefit of folks who might have missed uh, two weeks ago or weren't viewing at home is do a quick uh, synopsis of well, what please. we presented last time. Absolutely. And, uh, and then what we can do is uh, step into any questions the public or the, the board might have. Um, so uh, with that being said, I think, um, as I covered last time, uh, what's really important uh, about this project is um, that we've had a wide array of, of committee members and stakeholders and supporters that have a, a wide a variety of professional expertise in different fields from conservation biology, animal health and behavior, emergency first responders, natural resource management, and natural education uh, opportunities have informed what our programming decisions have been for this process and working with consultants that are environmental specialists, uh, Walsh Engineering for civil engineering work. Um, we've had a, a team that's really helped us uh, build our principles for this project, which include not impacting wetlands directly, uh, preserving some of the magical natural areas and features of the site, um, and where we can kind of keep a, a low impact where areas have already been cleared or previously worked uh, from past use. Um, so uh, with that being said, we had a really productive meeting with our abutters on July 11th, uh, where we engaged our neighbors um, to the project. Uh, we shared, as soon as we completed our site plan, we shared what those ideas were with those uh, folks and um, took some early questions and incorporated that into our thinking. And so uh, tonight, we're looking forward to extend that uh, this evening to the greater public. So um, what I'd like to do is give a little bit of a, a general overview of the site location, um, some of the on the ground kind of uh, photos of areas that we found were opportunities and what some of the natural character is that we're seeking to either preserve or tie back into uh, restoration sites, uh, as well as talk a little bit about the program we discussed two weeks ago, and then we'll open it up. So um, if we have specific questions, uh, Norm Chamberlain is here, who's uh, project manager and uh, licensed engineer with Walsh Engineering. And we also have uh, Russ Brady, who's representing the executive committee as uh, the committee chair for this project. Um, so. Uh, again, the Meadowwoods Preserve is a 48 and a half acre parcel here shown in this map, uh, and I think we have it online too, in orange. Um, it's an acre, uh, it's, a, it's a parcel that's about 48 and a half acres, as I said, to the north um, and to the northwest, there's some abutting uh, conservation lands that's about four to 500 acres or so um, that uh, is kind of sharing that edge to the, to the to the parcel. We have uh, road access on an existing gravel road down to uh, Mills Road, and uh, the project is just west of Oak Ridge Road. Um, about the first 500 feet or so are in the Goose Rocks Beach Zone, uh, which um, requires for community uh, building purposes to have site plan review, and the remainder 48 and a half acres are in the Free Enterprise Zone, which has a similar requirement. So that's part of why we're here this evening. Um, we uh, are focusing a majority of our program development in this white dashed uh, area. So we've tried to uh, keep where we could, um, any types of the new program would be in areas that have already been cleared uh, from past use. Um, as you can see here on these images, uh, this site was uh, a property that had um, some past use uh, for um, access roads, some cleared areas where uh, where gravel extraction and sand extraction had occurred. Microphone. And I'll get back to the mic. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, Tom. Um, and from satellite imagery, uh, you know, what those areas look like, from satellite imagery where these areas look like in the blue, 
2003, you can see where some of the uh, excavation zones were that filled in with water. And then over time in 2018, uh, some of the residual pool was a quarry pool here. Um, and this cleared area, we found a lot of opportunity for uh, prairie restoration and things like that. So um, again, what we're proposing uh, primarily in this dashed area, and this is where that cleared area is, um, is a program that will include uh, you know, trail access for people um, of, uh, of different multi-use. So it would be for hiking or biking, winter sports, um, use like that. We would have a dedicated uh, central area um, that would include uh, an ADA accessible trail loop that would be about a half a mile um, coming from the, the welcome hut that was mentioned in the center. So about an 800 square foot initially welcome hut wouldn't grow bigger than 1,100 square feet, small single family home size. Um, we would have uh, in, a, in an area that's already been cleared, uh, fenced in and closed and double gated uh, dog enclosure that would be for off leash dog use. So about an acre and a half of that area um, it's an area that would be, uh, Russ can speak more to any management questions for that, um, but we uh, see as having a, a staff member that would be there to support it with uh, all the accessories that are needed to help manage that space. We would have um, perimeter trails that would be those multi-use trails. The ADA's trail would be managed and signed for only pedestrians and people of all ages and abilities could use it. Um, and then it would be utilizing the existing gravel road with the addition of some emergency pull-offs. Uh, so those are, uh, that's kind of a spread of the main programming that we're talking about in that uh, dashed area enlargement. Um, and then the restoration features would be about 25,000 square feet of uh, various meadow restoration and an 8,500 square foot uh, small natural uh, pond feature that we had talked about uh, at the initial meeting as well. Um, so that's a little bit of an overview of what we're proposing, uh, some of the thinking and the expertise that's in, um, kind of been imparted into the principles of this process, and uh, just kind of a character of some of the images, you know, where we see kind of the clearings and opportunities for the program um, are features that have had some of the existing roads, some of the rutting that we would kind of uh, restore back into a naturalized condition, and then this is a cleared area where we might have that fenced-in enclosure space at the bottom here. Uh, and what we are inspired by um, is a condition of, and Tom, I'll get back to my mic in two shakes, <laughs> sorry. So, and, and what we've been inspired by is on the left image, um, this is an area further up to the north uh, boundary of the property with Beaver Pond Brook and is an example of what a typical uh, kind of a maple grove, a wet maple grove is on the, con on the site. <coughs> and then additionally, we have a lot of lowland uh, habitat areas that are open and sunny and then uh, a lot of hidden mound topography like we all know about Kenny Bunk Ports. So a lot of rock ledges and boulders, um, ferns, birches, uh, white pines and conditions like that. So that's kind of the, the character that we're seeking to wrap back into this uh, experience and some of the connections that we're seeking to create for the community. So with that, um, that was a little bit long of a summary, but uh, we'd like to open it up to questions. So thank you. Okay. So George, here's the, our uh, lead, so I'll let you start. Do you have questions? I, I'm not an expert on dog parks. And I know across the river they've got an area for uh, small dogs as well as large dogs. Is there any uh, demarcation in this dog zone? Um, I'll uh, quickly tee that off for, for Russ to contribute to that, but um, I will say initially this is seen as, as kind of a, a pilot mm -hmm. space, um, and with that I'll let Russ answer more specifically to that. Okay. Sure, thanks. Um, Russ Grady, Kenny Bunkport Conservation Trust. So our desire, um, future state longer term, is to have a small dog enclosure, a large dog, and even a smaller one for dogs that just don't get along with others. Um, <laughs> I'm not the expert, but we have plenty of them, um, veterinarians and otherwise. Um, but it's uh, our approach with this is to kind of is to build a phase one and to hopefully garner excitement um, and frankly money. Um, and then have the ability to design a phase two and then a, and then a smaller enclosure. Um, initially, we'll have to set some guidelines around hours of use um, so that uh, certain days and hours we'll have small dogs and certain days and hours it would be larger dogs. Um, but we've given a lot of thought to that and a lot more will go into it, uh, into the management of that aspect. Okay. Uh, 
You, you note on, on the plans a number of uh, trees that uh, go along the roadway, mm -hmm. and then also where you're putting in the welcome hut. Are you anticipating removing any trees? Yeah, um, a lot of those, so um, there are quite a few of them that are marked in the package um, where we will have to remove for the welcome hut. Um, we did measure, gosh, a lot of trees out there. Um, it's one of the things that we asked um, the surveyors and, and Richardson to do. Um, so yeah, some will be cleared. We try to keep it to a minimum. Um, and, and frankly, in some of those areas, um, if you were to take a walk out there, you'll see a ton of blow down thin stuff mm -hmm. um, common in our woods around here. Um, so in those areas, you know, we'll remove a lot of the, the refuse that's there to build the hut. And, and the welcome hut itself, we had some discussion about that last time. Mm -hmm. uh, it may potentially be enclosed with windows. Oh, it will. It'll be, th we're anticipating three season. Um, we'd like it to be off grid, so tied into a solar panel. Mm -hmm. um, and something that, you know, future state, as we raise more funds, um, staff person there welcoming people. Um, you know, short term, it, it's an area where uh, through our trust and education program, we might have uh, an educational class or opportunity or minimally a place for folks to get some water for their dogs and have a seat. And you, you um, talked about uh, um, this being sunrise to sunset. Mm -hmm. Is there any, are you anticipating lighting either in the welcome hut or along the roadway? So there'll be lights within the welcome hut. Um, along the roadway, this probably gets into your space. Um, so yeah. um, I don't believe so, but they're uh, along walkways. Um, there could be some low level. Um, but yes, you mean on it, the ADA trail? Um, I don't believe we have it out on the ADA trail. It's it, use of the property is dawn to dusk. Correct. So just to specifically pick up on those points, what we've included in our package is uh, an example of what would be kind of a, a fixture lighting that we might attach to the outside of the cabin, which would be a fixture that would be uh, full cutoff, um, kind of dark sky, night sky friendly, and uh, no more than 900 lumens. And then if we were to have um, some safety lighting or something of that nature for uh, for the parking area or at, at the gate enclosure in the internal space, uh, that would be something mounted on a post that we're anticipating would be about uh, 12 feet tall and would have a similar kind of dark sky friendly cutoff and would be under 1800 lumens. So we're seeking to do something that would be sensitive, um, you know, for where it is and uh, still allow for um, lighting, you know, if it were needed for, for the event. But as Russ had indicated, what we have been anticipating for uh, the use and hours of the program would be like other uh, conservation property in the dong to dusk, uh, you know, would be the, the that's the, the ideal kind of condition that we're anticipating. But not on the roadway uh, or at the entrance? Uh, we did, we are not anticipating having that at the roadway or the entrance. And signage? Um, signage, we're having, uh, we've marked some areas where you would have um, kind of like that uh, trailhead style kind of marquees. So, um, you know, like Appalachian Trail, kind of a, a little bit of a sheltered kiosk yeah. style sign. We would have um, signage that would be uh, sort of explain some of the use of some of the areas, for example, like the, the dog enclosure. Mm -hmm. um, and then there would be, uh, you know, kind of a trail marker type type of effect, like to, to be in the spirit of other uh, conservation trust property for uh, for some of the wayfinding and, and areas for the cabin. And what about the entrance? Um, at the entrance, we've had our initial discussions, and uh, Russ can speak to this a little bit more directly, but that conversation has um, tended towards the direction of, like at Emmons Preserve, the large kind of a granite, granite uh, stone um, marker. So we're speaking the language of what other conservation property is. Um, so people kind of know, you know, and are, are comfortable with what, what the property, who's, who's behind it and what, what they're coming into. And uh, there is a gate currently near the entrance, but not on the entrance. So there's room to park in front of that gate. And you said you don't anticipate that gate being closed. Is that correct? Um, I'll let Russ respond to that because that's a, a more of a program element that he's talked about. So one second. Okay. Um, so there's a gate there now. The Bryan family's had it there for years. It's, I think it's been swung open for as long as I've driven by. Um, we will have a gate um, here towards the end of any vehicular traffic and the fire department will have a key as will the Bryant family um, so they can get to their property here. Um, there'll be a gate down by Mills Road. Um, it's anticipated that that gate might be left open as it is today. Um, it'll be nice to have in the event that um, 
any concerns arise, we'd have the opportunity to close towards Mills Road. Um, and uh, just in addition on the signage piece, um, today we've already installed a few very small signs indicating private property. And so we want to, um, you know, to be good neighbors as folks pull into the property, um, very subtly um, identify that the right side of the road is Bryant land private property and the left side would be conservation land. Other people's private property, not the land trust. Correct. La uh, we mentioned that this is obviously a place where law enforcement could turn around as they patrol along mm -hmm. Route 9 mm -hmm. uh, because it's right next to the Biddeford line and that there haven't really been any issues with the other conservation uh, properties. It, it would seem to me that sometimes, uh, if I re remember my youth correctly, that uh, it was nice to find a place where you could uh, uh, go at night and uh, uh, be private. Uh, so. <laughs> Uh, th this looks like a great spot for that for people from a variety of communities and I just wanted to uh, hear you say again that law enforcement said that they didn't find a problem with this. No, um, so we, we met specifically with the fire department. Today um, the police department does patrol Gravelly Brook and a number of our other sites and if you're able to turn on the scanner you'll hear you know a site inspection of 1360 or what have you um, and so we um, I have casually alerted some that this is our property now, um, but we will more formally let them know, and they're always welcome to go down and do a turnaround and do a site check, and they typically do those at least, um, you know, once per shift. Uh, they could speak to it more, but uh, they frequent Gravelly Brook often in other locations, and in fact, there have been some locations where we've asked them to go more frequently, and they, they've been great in doing so. Okay. Other yes. yes. So you folks have, you know, other conservatory properties. Are there any dog parks on any of those? No. So this will be the first? Yep. Were any other of your properties considered? Um, no. <laughs> you know, so on a lot of our other properties, we have, um, as it stands today, just uh, people walk their dogs commonly. You know, if you pull up to Gravelly Brook and the Emmons Preserve or out to Smith, um, we always encourage folks to walk their dogs on a leash or to have the dogs under voice control. Um, there's wood somewhere. Um, but we, uh, since I've been involved with the trust, we haven't had an issue. Um, we find that the people, our visitors, in fact, today, a couple from Connecticut stopped by the headquarters and walked their dogs on a leash for a good uh, two and a half mile loop. Um, so, no, this, you know, this property, I think because of how it exists today um, with some cleared, a lot of our properties aren't cleared, they're forested. Um, this has a lot of clearing that has taken place. It has a road infrastructure. Um, you know, if Tom were here, he could speak to it. Um, our executive director, Tom Bradbury, he could speak to it in greater detail, but for quite some time, we've looked for a spot to do something like this to provide people an alternative. Um, a woman today called the headquarters to ask, when will this be done? Because I'm tired of driving all the way to Kennebunk. Um, so uh, this is, this, you know, for a number of reasons, the road, the clearings, what have you, proximity, you know, to, um, to the beach and other areas presented us with a wonderful opportunity to do it here. Um, just the cost alone, we're talking over a quarter of a million dollars for road and clearing if we were to do it on an existing property. Is there any estimate of how many dogs will be there a day? We don't know. Um, and that's why we're starting with, with one enclosure. And we're starting with, you know, some rules to allow for large dogs and small dogs. Um, there, you know, I wish I had a crystal ball. The people that we've talked to and the folks on our committee um, have great enthusiasm and excitement over this. Um, you know, the folks at Pooches and Gooches and, and Strut Your Mutt and all, you know, all the groups um, that I've, I've become familiar with now um, are, sound super excited, but we don't know. We will, I, I will say that, you know, um, that we're going to have some rules in place around, you know, documentation of vaccination and being current and being healthy. Um, stuff that doesn't quite exist in other dog parks. We want this to be kind of a little bit, um, I'll say just like best in class. So that folks, we have a lot of on our committee that 
um, have dogs but don't bring their dogs to dog parks because of concern of disease and, and, and that type of stuff. So um, we're taking great measure to make sure that, um, that this is a safe and a best-in-class location for people to bring their dogs. And, you know, I think we mentioned earlier, um, we need to raise a lot of money to get us to our, our ideal future state, which includes staffing and, you know, potential key card passage into these gates. Initially, it's, we'll have a strict set of documented rules, great signage, and we'll have, you know, folks opening and closing um, the enclosures. Um, after that, it can only get better. One last one. What's the closest proximity of homes or a neighborhood? Um, so if you go this way, I, I, on the town GIS map, I think I st stretch the measurement tape out to about 750 feet or so. If you swing over here towards um, some Bryant homes, I think it's about the same through a heavily forested and kind of a humpy area. Um, and when I looked at all of the abutters, at least in terms of planning board review, I think the furthest was a little over a thousand feet away. So just to add to that, if you don't mind, I mean, so uh, again, Robert Massengale, uh, Richardson Associates. Um, in addition to that, with terrain, I mean, if you think about things like noise or things of those uh, those kinds of aspects, um, when you're dealing uh, with the physics of sound, it's sort of like line of sight. So when we have pit and mound topography like we have here, if you're talking about uh, Mrs. Bryant's property, um, which is uh, lower down to this area, we have a lot of um, ledges, a lot of higher topography that's that's there, whereas in, in the uh, dog area, some of the design features that we've been developing and considering and what we uh, referenced in the plan were uh, aspects of berms, some topography and things that would not only uh, sort of minimize some of um, some of those outside kind of uh, um, residual kind of effects like noise or something like that, but also for the benefit of the dogs, you know, having continuous circulation flows so no dog feels cornered, having areas where you're not being surprised through, um, you know, kind of an open area where somebody might come around the bend. So, you know, in terms of the thinking that that's, that's what's going on in addition to citing this, like Russ had said, um, you know, over six to 700 feet away from the nearest home. Excellent. Thank yeah, you. You're welcome. Okay. So, okay. So, so, so I had a question. Sure. So, yeah. so you have a couple of ponds on here. Sure. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, is there continuous water flow through the ponds? Um, we are. We were showing um, what was kind of a channel. What's an existing? Essentially, what's existing there now is a ditch. It's a it's a bucket width ditch that was created for draining the site, and what we're. Um, proposing to do is create kind of a wet meadow area. So there would be a little bit of a drainage um, happening, but I, primarily because of the because of the levelness of the grades, it's not something that would be like a new creek or brook type of feature. So when we're, we're thinking about that kind of a drainage, essentially the pond would be, um, which is this new pond here, would be its own discrete kind of uh, presence. And that's the 8,500 uh, square foot uh, pond feature that we're talking about. You discussed the last time feeding it from wells and uh, aerating and things like that. So, you know, we're concerned that you not generate a nice mosquito uh, habitat. Absolutely, absolutely. And we discussed some of those strategies, you know, yes. whether it is sort of breaking surface tension of the water, you know, mm -hmm. with various means, whether it is through. Uh, kind of gravity or an aeration um, opportunity. I think also thinking about uh, just the type of plant palette that we're creating and what type of um, you know natural environment we're doing. If we can create uh, insect relationships where you know you have a predation of mosquito library and things of that nature going on, um, and ultimately you know having an area that's uh, that's got some of those strategies employed will help. But again, we're we're in a site. There's a lot of natural uh, wetland kind of characteristics going on, so we're not looking to do anything to to impact any of the natural habitats or ecosystems there. So, I mean, I think a little bit of, like everyone living in Maine, there's a period of just adjusting to some presence of mosquitoes, too. So, so my question actually um, is directed toward um, what, what happens if we get a, you know, big uh, downfall of rain or a big snow melt? Um, uh, what's the provision for making sure that the water drains from those ponds away from 
any dwelling or any other facility that um, you know floodwaters could could uh, you know could affect. Absolutely, I'll I'll address this kind of generally, and then I'll uh, let Norm, if if he feels the need to add anything, can can contribute to that. Um, so typically, where the the direction of flow is on the site is down into this direction, where um, Beaver Brook, uh, Beaver Pond Brook comes here and it wraps around the northern boundary. Uh, so the way the grades are going, everything is flowing this di this direction, which is, um, again, the, the Bryant uh, nearest household lower off, off map is down to the south. Um, the inholding here is where some of the storage materials happened, and it's it's flowing in the direction down to the the creek. We find that um, we're we're creating a condition where a lot of that area, as shown in the photographs, has been cleared and compacted, and there's a lot of gravel. So, in terms of an infer impervious uh, surface condition, um, we're seeking you know by restoring that into uh, prairie and meadow condition, we're actually creating more absorptive uh, kind of naturalized surfaces that'll be able to take in. Uh, larger storm events and things of that nature. And then to supplement that, we're, we've um, strategically thought about where to have things like rain gardens, uh, placing some culverts to help with drainage coming from the road and things of that nature. So I hope that starts to answer some of your question. And if, Norm, if you have anything to add. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay. This is... Uh, this is unique in my limited experience on the planning board. And uh, I'm, I'm going to really address my re remarks to, to, to Russ here, okay. um, who, who has had in the past some experience on the planning board. This is, this is unique. I say it's unique in that uh, we're used to people coming in with, with site plans that are pretty detailed and specific, and we're sort of making a yay or nay decision based on those specifics. What, what I feels like we have here is a, uh, a proof of concept phase. You, you have some, some wonderful ideas uh, as to what can be done with, with the site. My, my sense is that in a year's time, you're going you're gonna to know a lot more about what it makes sense to do, and that you might expose some problem areas. You, you may not. Um, ho hopefully, the fundraising will go well, and, and you'll have, you know, the ability to do to do more. But but what my concern is is that uh, we're we're looking at uh, this because it is a, a conditional use, and and I find myself wondering how how would we go about approving this conditional use and yet still keep some reins on it, given that you haven't decided an awful lot of things about how it's going to be used and and how it might be expanded. You made some mention earlier about, well, we really don't plan on, on uh, we, we plan on our initial work being done in the areas that are already developed. All right, is, is that a condition of approval? Well, that, that seems rather restrictive, but it, it, it's really just uh, symptomatic, I think, of, of what I'm hearing is that, that this, is a, this is a vision right now. And uh, what's, what signage are we gonna have? Well, we think it's, probably going to be kind of like our other properties. All right, is that what you're doing, or is it that might change after we approve this? Or how do we go about getting some, some purchase on what it is we're, we're really approving? Is there a way, has there ever been a, a situation where we've said, well, this, this really is unique. It, we're doing some pathfinding here. How's the dog park going to work? Are we going to say, well, it's only going to be approved for daylight hours and it's only going to be approved when it's staffed and everybody's going to have to show their veterinary certificate. Well, you know, in six months' time, you may find that that isn't necessary, that some other process works much better. I expect that's what you will find, right? Yeah. This is, this is a pathfinding mission. Is there a possibility of looking at this as a conditional approval of a conditional use that says, Here's a set of concerns we have. We don't think they're showstoppers, but we don't want to approve the park that says, well, you're going to go build this pond, and it may or may not have mosquitoes, and uh, we may or may not do something about them if it does. Or the E. coli. What, what are we going to do if it turns out you know, that this uh, educational facility we're putting in to go monitor the state of E. coli shows up, up something untoward, even though we don't think it's going to? 
th there's a whole list of them I had here. Mosquitoes, lighting, we're going to have lighting. We don't think it's going to interfere with anybody. But what if there are abutters who don't think there's going to be concerns, but, but there are concerns later on? Do, do, you you take, like do, do you take my point that, that how, how do we go about approving this with some bounds on it? So we're here before you to seek approval to build a pond where we believe one once existed that will feed by way of a, a maybe bed you know, stream. There's a pipe here underground right now where water gathers and goes into this pond that already exists yeah. to stay away from a significant vernal pool to build an ADA compliant trail to bring a welcome hut here and to have an off-leash dog enclosure there. So um, none of those things by themselves involve us. Well, it's a park. It's the park. And that's a community and house. And the community house. That, right. That's right. So those that's are the, right. It's those two things. I understand. And, the, and that's why I'm saying I have a hard time saying that isn't a great use of that land. Yeah. Except that when it comes before the planning board, we're obliged to look at, you know, sort of the health and safety issues, and, and, and we have this list of concerns that we're articulating. Maybe well, Werner could speak to, I don't know. Well, I, I think I've heard, I've heard an awful... put you on the spot. Yeah, not a problem. <laughs> well, we you know, I've heard an awful lot of information, you know, in terms of, you know, in terms of what the trust is, you know, is put forward. You know, and I think, you know, what the planning board has to decide to some degree as you, you know, as you look at this, this application and others that might come, you know, in front of you, is, you, know, you have to figure out what's within your jurisdiction and what isn't within your jurisdiction and what is information that's just being brought forward to you to help you understand kind of the big picture in terms of what's, you know, what's going to occur on the property. Uh, you know, I think, you know, things like, you know, the hours of operation, just as an example, you know. Um, it's good to know that, you know. It's good to have a kind of a sense in terms of telling folks what that's going to be like, you know. I, I come at it more from the, you know, the, 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 the practical and say, well, um, Conservation Trust Headquarters does moonlight walks. Am I going to get a phone call and somebody says, hey, they're having a moonlight walk out there? No, I, I, I would hope not, you know, but at the same time, you know, when things get presented as saying, you know, well, dusk to dawn, uh, I just like want to be cautious with the planning board that, you know, some of those things don't wind up finding themselves in these very strict conditions of, of approval Couldn't that, agree more. that we often wind up with. Absolutely right. Uh, but so I, you have to find that line of where this is within your purview and this is additional information that's great information to have because it gives us a sense of how this property is going to operate uh, but may not necessarily be within you know the purview of the planning board uh, you know, lighting is a perfect example i know you know i've discussed with other applicants on different projects keeping lumens below a certain point you know keeps you out of the uh, review by the lighting committee you know, and still there's a way to achieve, you know, lighting that you want on site without having to go through, you know, a whole process. Uh, you know, does that mean if they decide they want to add another light fixture to the building that it comes back to the planning board? I hope not. Clearly uh, we don't want that. <laughs> no. Yes, but, but I want enough right. information and, and, and assurance that, that the lighting is going to allow me to go through the guidelines for decisions and say that condition C is met. The proposed exterior lighting will not create hazards to motorists traveling on the roads and is adequate for the safety of our, you know. Sure. That it, that that's right. You want to be able to. stays in those. That's in right. That you want to be able to go through, you want to be able to go through the list and be able to, you know, check those, you know, check those questions that's off, right, you know. Right. And I think to some degree the only way you get there is to start that, you know, is to. Oh, perhaps. You know, is to start yep. going through that and say, all right, so this, you know, under 1010, you, you know, we have this particular question. Well, they've talked an awful lot about right. X, and, you know, do we think that within our purview, you know, that that is been so, adequately So, so let, me, let me go back to my opening statement. This is unique in that in most of the other cases, we've come in with an applicant who says, here's the lighting I am proposing to use. And there, it's going to be this tall, and it's going to be this many lumens, and we can say, well, no, can you can you consider making an adjustment? And we agree on the adjustment, and then we're done. Here, what I'm hearing is, well, 
we, we think we're going to have a light on the outside of the building. Um, right now, we're not going to have any lights on the, on the road. We, we might later, is, is my inference. So uh, you, you see what the, I'm saying? It's are soft. the lighting examples within the packet insufficient in terms of lumens and what type of light and at what height? No, I'm really remarking on the, the answers that, that we're getting to questions, Russ. That's all. But it says, well, our current discussion is this, leading me to believe that this is still in flux. Yeah, it's not. Um, I, I mean, you can speak to the lighting. Sure. Uh, I mean, I think uh, Council's making a, a broader point, but to the to the lighting question, um, we we were looking at specific fixtures and and heights and where those are. And so, in terms of uh, for some of the enlargements, um, for example, uh, you know what we're talking about with with kind of the wall lighting element in terms of the of what the specifications are for that product and how that uh, mount would happen on the side of a building. You know, those are. That's an example of what it is specifically that we're we're thinking of putting onto that structure. So the only lighting you're um, considering is is low level lighting on the exterior of the building, and of course lights inside the structure. And we also were considering for uh, kind of that a gooseneck fixture that would adhere to a to a vertical post that would be something that would give a little bit of area lighting to an, an environment like a parking area or by the internal gate, for example, um, that, uh, like on L203. Okay. Yeah. Nothing on the, uh, you're not going to light the, the sign the at, the, at the entrance to the road, the, the, the granite structure, for example? Um, we, we were not intending to have a light like that at the, at the granite entrance, but. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, part of that challenge seems to be is that uh, a park is an approved uh, conditional use right yeah but we don't have a really strong we have a sense of what a park is but we don't have a strong definition of what a park is yeah, yeah, yeah right nor do we you know have, what a warehouse nor do you have a, like. a <laughs> nor do you have a set of standards either right. you know that says that oh you know if you're going to design park has to be this distance by that distance that's right no and i think that's this. what that, that's not a bad thing though i, I think <clears> that this <throat> this is a unique property and a unique <clears throat> application that <clears throat> and and the and the land trust uh, the kennebunkport port land trust is a powerful force for good in this town. So, you know, I have, I'm inclined to, to listen to what they're proposing and, and I, I just want to do right by what we're charged with doing here on the planning board. Yeah. That's all. When they, when they come to building the, little, the uh, welcome hut, they come to you for a building permit still, right? Correct, mm -hmm. yes. Does it, we didn't, we aren't brought blanket already. No, it. so, you know, yeah, so I'll jump ahead to kind of the, you know, the practical you know, the practical application of, you know, of, of a plan like this, you know, and, you know, so one of the question, you know, one of the things that I heard was kind of a question in terms of the size of the building, okay? Yep. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. between, you know, this amount of square footage and this amount of square footage. So I'd like to know, you know, for, you know, for my purposes, I'd like to know what it is that I should be expecting to see, you know, in terms of a permit, a building permit application. Right. Uh, you know, and it should, you know, it should be what's depicted on the plan, you know, at that, uh, at that stage. If it's going to be 1,200 square feet, fine, it's, it's 1,200 square feet. You know, but I, you know, I want, for my purposes and for, you know, for anybody, you know, on uh, town staff that does any inspections out there, we want it to be consistent with the plan. Um, you know, now at the end of the day, if they decide to change a light fixture from a gooseneck to something else, you know, for my purposes, I consider something like that a de minimis change, and if it still meets the same lumen out, you know, if it's still the same lumens as what was, you know, what was presented here, fine. I don't, you know, I don't see those, you know, minor modifications or maybe some design, you know, considerations that happen when, you know, when a plan starts to get enacted as being necessary to come back here. Uh, but I think it is important to note you know, to know that what's presented here is what the plan is. And you know, there was discussion about phasing, you know, and I think that's important. Uh, that's also important for, for me to understand is, all right, we generally understand this is phase one. Uh, it's helpful that if, that 
for the board to recognize those types of things, I think, in a set of findings that, you know, the beginning phase may be this, you know, but the, you know, the overall, you know, the overall plan is going to be what's, you know, what's presented here. Uh, and that that may occur over, I don't know, two, two years, three years. Those are the types of things that, um, that I think I need a little bit more direction on and understanding about. But we Thank approve you. the conditional use. Correct. As, right. And if they make, as you say, de minimis changes later, it doesn't have to come back to us. I'm just worried right. that we not write too too big a uh, finding of facts sure. that, that limits them to they shall do exactly what this yeah. piece of paper said. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, you want your findings to be consistent with the plan that's presented. Yep. You know, however, also recognizing that you know there are you know there are times when you know you make you know you make a zig instead of a zag. You know, on a on a trail. Um, right. You know, for example, because of a because of a constraint. Away. That's yes. right. Because of a constraint that wasn't so, you know that wasn't recognized. So, so let, let me give you an example. Um, I'll, this is an exaggeration. We approved this plan. It shows. Uh, a pond uh, be, being built. There's talk about a future pond at some point. Uh, we've identified this as the the only pond that would be introduced for the for the for the property. If if anything, this would be the future pond, which is this pond proposed in the right corner. I'm I'm sorry. There's an existing quarry pond and a future pond. Correct. Is the one we're talking about. Yes. So the, right. the, 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 just a part of my interruption, but just to clarify, um, yep. that existing quarry pool is here, yep. and um, the, the new feature would be uh, to plan right up. That's the proposed one. Yes, right. correct. That's correct. So, so we say fine. All right. And everybody knows <clears throat> the findings of facts are written. Two years from now, pond worked out really well. You want to build another one. Planning board has already approved this as a conditional use. It's still a park. Okay. You still got your building. To me, that would be an expansion of the park, and I would want it to come back to the planning board. What, uh, what, oh, please go ahead. And, and I'm, I'm asking for the board and for Werner's comment on that thought. And, yeah, and no, I that's deliberately exaggerated it sure. as, a, as a pretty what I think is a pretty significant change. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, so I'll give you an example of what, you know, what maybe wouldn't necessarily come back, you know, uh, you know, some additional trail work out on that property, you know, yeah. uh, is not something that we, you know, that we would bring in front of the front of the planning board, you Clearing know, but some, some trees, right, you know, things that are, you know, that are already, you know, permitted and permissible <coughs> activities out yeah. there, you know, are, you know, are things that I wouldn't expect to, you know, to have brought back to the board, you know, but you know, things like a significant drainage feature change, you know, that's significant in terms of a modification to a previously approved plan, you know, that's, uh, you know, that's not going to fall within, you know, that's not going to fall within a, a de minimis, you know, a de minimis change or, you know, the typical activities that you would expect uh, with passive recreation, like additional trails, you know, that are going to continue, you know, throughout the you know, the acreage that they have. But you could see how an argument could be made that said oh, yeah. it's still a park. No, absolutely. And that's, that's what I want to guard, no, I, I guard don't, against. I don't mean this jokingly, but it's going to come out that way. What if it were a labyrinth? <laughs> that was that was because it was in, it came. in RP, and none of this is RP. Uh, you know, I'll, uh, so... Thank you. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> That wouldn't come here if it weren't um, an RP problem. I can appreciate the exaggeration, but it somewhat implies that we might want to do things without asking permission in the future, and that's not the case at all. Anything that we do is going to be through Werner in the office, and if Werner says we go before planning board, we'll come before planning board. The vision we have today is this, and with the hope that maybe we raise money for another thing here, and if we do, then we go talk to Werner if he says go before the planning board again, we'll come before you again. We have no opposition to that. Please, Russ, my, my, uh, my apologies if you, if you took me that way, but there was no intent to imply that you would fail to ask permission. <laughs> yeah. Really, it's the machinations of, of the way we structure our, our town government. Fair enough. I don't think Werner is required to bring that to the planning board unless we have that discussion now yeah. and we basically get agreement that that, yeah. that that would be a significant enough change that it would come back to the planning board. That's fair. Because right. you could make the argument, someone could make the argument that said, 
but we already approved it as a park. Right, and, and I appreciate that. That's all. We, if, if when we talk to him, and I do a lot, <laughs> um, and I bring whatever experience I, I remember from sitting where you are, um, if he says we need to go before the planning board to do something, then we'll do it. We're, we're seeking to do things the right way, um, as we have in the past. Thank you. So the findings of facts might include language that said uh, that if there are significant variations from this plan in the future, upon review by the Code Enforcement Office, it may return to the board. Something like that, yeah. Does that work? It, it does. Okay. Okay. Um, Public forum. Are you done? Thank you. Okay. Well, I think that I can open up the public hearing at this point. So anyone would like to uh, speak or ask questions of the board or of the uh, presenters? I'd love to have you. No butters? Nobody here? To... Well, in that case, I will close the public hearing. Uh, okay. Um, So, I guess we're ready to uh, to approve this. And uh, George, I think we'll probably want to take a few cuts at your finding of facts yes. along the way. I'm not. I don't expect you to read them tonight, quite honestly. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't have my printer. Yeah, uh, yeah you could run home and print them again. That was a little <laughs> fun. That was exciting. <laughs> I'd make a motion that we uh, accept this application as complete. We I did said. that already. We did. It's already complete. Mm -hmm. we, this is approving that we... Then I make a motion that we approve the application. Yeah, or disagree. Okay. All, all in favor? Okay. Thank you all. So, thank you guys. And, um, and, good and good luck, hopefully good luck we'll get it. a finding of facts out in a couple of weeks. You don't have to be here to, to listen to it if you don't wish to. I wouldn't miss it. Oh, I know you wouldn't <laughs> miss it. You're, you're just a... Very exciting. Thank you. Uh, we Pl appreciate planning it. board groupie. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> anyway, yeah. all right. The uh, Larry item number two is the finding of facts for the Henry Family Trust. Uh, yep. And you know, I want to get on with other things, and we, you can uh, whenever we get to ten o'clock, you can read that. And okay. No sign it off. Yeah. Send motor, Larry. Okay. So that means that we now are back to Kenny Bunkport Marina, Sebago Techniques, reopening the public hearing. First, we, we need to now hear from uh, Steve about all of the changes that he's made based on, on previous hearings. You've, you've had at least two submissions of everything and tons of new pictures, and want to hear everything. Yep. It visible okay? Oh, we all have copies, so. No. Can you want it on the other side? Get it on the screen. Okay. There we go. <coughs> good. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm Steve Doe from Sebago Technics. Also with me tonight is Sean Dumas. Um, from the Kennebunkport Marina. Um, uh, we've made some changes to the plan uh, based on um, the August 7th planning board meeting. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. And also there was a uh, site walk held on August 9th with the uh, cemetery committee. Um, and I'll go over those um, items uh, throughout the presentation. Um, so on August 14th, I submitted a letter with the revised plans and I had some itemized items, 13 items on that. <clears throat> so what I'll do is I'll go through them item by item just to clarify for the board and for the public. Um, so the first item was um, during the public hearing, uh, Mr. Wyman, who was, is um, located across the street, um, 
he owns the residence over here, which is, they have the horse farm on there. Um, so they were concerned about the driveway access, which was directly across from his house. Um, and he was also concerned about the views into the site and also seeing the buildings. So uh, to address his concerns, uh, we moved the driveway um, to be across from uh, Tucker's Lane. And we had some boat storage in here, if you remember that. Uh, we've moved that out of that area in order to preserve um, a large tree stand, which is, this is really the significant tree stand in front of his property. Uh, so we're preserving that. And then to supplement the view, because um, it is very large trees, but there's a lot of it's deciduous. So we're adding some evergreen plantings closer to the building, um, up in this area, to supplement that closer to the structure. And then we're placing some larger shade trees um, in this area, because the, the large tree stand is essentially from my hand in this direction. Going from here over is mostly um, field that's slowly overgrowing. There's some pine in there, but it, it's mostly low growth. Um, so anyway, we moved the driveway. <clears throat> um, we have received a DOT permit, which I had forwarded to Warner. I assume he has sent that to the board. Mm -hmm. And that's for the new driveway entrance <laughs> location. Uh, the second item was, um, uh, the cemetery committee did find what appeared to be the cemetery out there, and we did locate that. Um, it's located right up in here. Um, it was about a 12 foot by 12 foot area of a very unique ground cover, which is very typical of a old cemetery. It was a plant material that was planted in cemeteries. There was um, uh, lilies of the valley, and it was very confined to a very specific area. And this 12 by 12 is very typical of a family plot. Um, and then actually, we actually got the survey crew out there and located it. And actually by the ground plane itself, you could see it was flat and that the land had been sculptured or sculpted around it to create this, this area. So, um, and it was, it was in a location that was similar to where um, uh, Joseline, Josephine Hunt had said it would be. Um, we did walk it, um, a neighbor up the street was there as well. So anyway, we've identified that. Um, the, um, if this project goes forward, the marina will, has agreed to put granite posts around it, identify it and clear it, you know, remove any old growth that's in there that shouldn't be there. Um, with that, with any cemetery in the state of Maine, you have to have a 25 foot setback from that. And that's because if there's any bodies that have been married, buried outside of the defined plot, that you're not disturbing that. So, um, this green area is the 25 foot setback and we've actually gone about 35 feet around it to give a little extra uh, separation of that. Um, all the trees are obviously going to be retained except probably in the cemetery plot itself. Um, in doing that, uh, by providing that separation, we had to make some site plan changes. So we cut back on um, some boat storage that we had in this location. And this building was also located up in that area. <clears throat> so we've moved that building to the uh, front corner of the property, um, which is going to still be 50 feet from the right of way of um, Log Cabin Road and 75 from uh, uh, Fairfield Hill Road. Um, that building is going to be wood construction versus metal. It'll have clapboards on it, look more like a uh, a barn type building. We've actually raised the pitch of the roof a little bit more on that too to get away from the flatter roof you typically see on a metal building. Um, uh, the third item, um, with all the changes of moving this entrance, eliminating this boat storage, uh, we cut back significantly on the pavement again. Um, we've cut back almost 8,000 square feet of pavement from the previous um, plan. Um, this represents about a 30% reduction over the original proposal we had. Um, so this gets it under an acre of impervious, which does now no longer require a DEP stormwater permit. Um, it will require a, um, or it doesn't require a stormwater law permit. It does require a permit by rule, which we have applied for. And under that permit, they only essentially look at erosion control measures. Um, whereas before, they would be looking at stormwater treatment, water quality, and items like that. <clears throat> um, but understanding the concern with the uh, top washing of the boats, we're still going to maintain 
the um, uh, Filtera unit, which collects the stormwater and filters it. That's located over here. And then the detention basin is still going to have that gravel um, filter bed in it, again, to, to collect any water in that. Um, again, that's not a requirement for the town or the DEP, but the applicant is going to continue with that. Uh, we're still meeting the uh, peak control runoff of the town and flooding. Uh, we have two outlet control structures still, one located over here, and then there's another one located over there. Um, the other item that the board had asked for was uh, some more clarification from DEP on the bottom washing, or the top washing. Um, so Sean was able to get a letter from Pam Parker, um, an email confirmation on that, that it's a de minimis, de minimis activity that they don't regulate. <clears throat> uh, the Lovejoys, who are located over here, um, they expressed concern um, about seeing the building, even with the distance that we have it at. Um, the separation between this tree line and the property line is 120 feet, and there's an additional 40 feet on their land. So it's about 160 feet of woodland between us and them. Um, it is mostly deciduous, so we've added some evergreens um, alongside the building there to help buffer that in the um, uh, <coughs> wintertime. Um, just another item that really isn't, wasn't questioned, but we're going to put the power underground. Um, uh, Larry, I think, had a question on the septic system. Um, yes. So we did, <clears throat> I did talk to our soil scientist on that, and he did confirm that it's designed adequately for 25 employees. He did not count the shower because it's an emergency shower, it's not used. Had it been included, if it was a daily use, the employee count would go down, but um, again, it's an emergency shower, shower only, so we didn't count that. Uh, the septic is located 100 feet from any abutting wells. <clears throat> um, item number eight on my um, letter was um, uh, Sean had contacted or contracted with uh, Tom Siegel, president of C Prime Valuation Group, LLC, to do an evaluation um, to see if a commercial property located in a residential area would affect property values. And he did have a report. He evaluated uh, three locations in the state of Maine, southern Maine. Uh, one was in Kennebunkport. Um, the other one was in Cumberland and also in Wells. And they looked at, um, I don't know if you had a chance to read the report that was sent. So I don't want to um, elaborate too much on it. but. The result of that was that the, it wasn't the commercial property that devalued the properties, it was the condition of the residential properties or the abutting residential homes and the condition of the homes. Um, they looked at locations very similar to this. Um, they looked on major roads where there was large commercial buildings. Some were located close to the road, some had wooded buffers. And then they looked at the houses nearby, whether they were across the street, or down the road. And you could only look at properties that actually were sold, because that's really the only, the only information they could have. Um, so anyway, that report had those three different areas. They looked at numerous houses in those locations. And um, I think the report speaks for itself on that. Um, the board also asked for some perspective views of the property. So uh, again, these are computer generated, but uh, we got two different views. Um, this view is looking at the intersection, uh, this being the um, Log Cabin Road, this being Fairfield Hill. So this would be installation um, when the project is first built. This would be the building uh, on the corner. Um, and then we have the evergreen plantings located around it. Um, this kind of symbolizes the existing growth as it's starting to grow up. These would be the large trees that are located at the corner. And this would be the woodland in the background. And then this one on the bottom here is assuming a 10, 15 year growth of the evergreens. And as those evergreens start growing out, the building starts disappearing. Um, and, and then this view <clears throat> 
is um, looking from the Wyman's driveway towards the facility. So their house would be over here looking at it. So you can start seeing this is the larger building. This is a large tree stand in the front. This is the um, building located at the corner. Um, and this is the driveway and the sign uh, heading in. And then the bottom one is it after a 10, 15 year growth period. And that's those images I were sent to you, I think by email. Yeah. <clears throat> um, the board also asked us to evaluate the culverts. Uh, there's two culverts that um, this project drains to. <clears throat> Um, located over here is a 24-inch culvert. Um, uh, there's no um, obstructions in it. It's clear all the way through. There's a little bottom corrosion on the pipe, but uh, the stormwater plan we have uh, doesn't impact that, doesn't increase the flows, and um, the condition of the culvert uh, is no, con no concern with the capacity. Uh, the second culvert is located over here. And that was a 12-inch pipe. There was a little leaf litter in the bottom, but again, it was clear of obstructions and um, uh, there was no capacity issues at that culvert. Um, as far as uh, fire protection, I discussed this new plan with uh, Chief Everett, and he said he didn't have any concerns with this plan. Um, we are, the applicant has agreed to uh, install a um, early warning system in the facility. They're also going to have smoke detectors, heat sensors, and security cameras on it. Um, and they also have a battery backup, so there's communication uh, if the power goes out with the fire department. Um, there, was question, there was notes about adding no parking signs and some fire lane and um, uh, painting out the boat storage area, so we've done that. And I think that's... All I need to talk about at this point, so. Okay, so uh, board members, questions? So I, I had one. No. So, so thanks for confirming the septic design. So I just had a context question. So this form, this H, this 15448 HIT, looks like a standard yep. form. So is this a DEP form or is it a Sebago form? It's a... Uh, it's a state form. State form. So yeah. when this form is filled out, does anybody like the DEP approve it? Or is it just... Werner approves it. No. It, Werner approves it. It comes to the LPI. Okay. Yeah. So everything on this form is just between the owner, Sebago, and Werner. Correct. Okay. Well, if Werner likes it, I like it. <laughs> In terms of the septic design. Okay. Good. Thank you. Steve, a question for you. Um, <clears throat> the operator of the property has a property in Biddeford where Correct. they do the bottom Correct. cleaning. Yeah, all their maintenance is done at the Biddeford facility or the marina. Could you tell us the location of that? Uh, you know where Jeunesse Concrete products are on Route 1? We, if you go down Route 1 into Biddeford, if you're coming from Arundel, you come up to the light to get back to the, to head to the interstate. And if you know that intersection. Okay. Okay, is it near the... the uh, Biddeford connector, they call it? The Biddeford yeah. connector. Okay, so it's not near the Biddeford... Uh, water treatment? No, no. So if you continue at that light, you go down a quarter of a mile. Three driveways. Pardon? Three driveways. Three driveways. So you got a, you got the veterinary on the corner. Then there's Jeunesse Products, and then their boat yard is right there. It's on the left hand side. Okay, hip. And they've not had any fire problems. Never had a prayer problem. Okay, thank you. I love good main directions. <laughs> okay. okay. If the board is finished, I guess I will reopen the public hearing. Uh, one thing, I'd, we want to hear comments on the new plan, not the comments, you know, I don't need to hear the same things again that we heard before. What we need to hear is, does this help, you know, and, and or not, or just want to hear from from the public on this again, but not you know not just repeat of past public hearings. So, uh, can I start with the butters, perhaps? Any butters that would like to speak? Okay. Uh, as always, 
As always, identify yourself. Hi, I'm Alan Lovejoy. I'm on a director butter. I live at 95 Log Cabin Road with my wife Megan and my two children. Um, I've got a little bit of a statement prepared here to read off. Um, while I can understand why the Kingdom of Port Marina wants to put their boat storage here, we don't feel that it fits in here and it's the best use of the property. Uh, the fact they are planting, by my count, uh, 54 new trees to hide the building kind of goes to show that it doesn't really fit in the neighborhood. Uh, the trees that they are planting are all under eight feet. Uh, the last revision included five of these in the north side of the building facing my property um, after we expressed concern. Um, the five trees under eight feet to hide an 86 foot long wall by 20 feet high um, on the side of the building that gets little to no sun. We don't feel is going to hide it at all. Uh, the perspectives of the new building that the board requested fail to show an angle of the largest building on site, I feel, you know, the 135 foot long one. You know, it's kind of, I don't know if it's by design or by just the angles they picked, but neither of them really show what that building will, will look like from the road. Um, the images they do provide are titled 10 to 15 year plantings. Um, it's a little consolation knowing that my five-year-old son who starts kindergarten at KCS tomorrow will be graduating high school before they look like those pictures. It's gonna take a long time for them to get to that level. Um, I forwarded a letter to the board from a local real estate agent with 20 years of local experience that states her, in her professional opinion, and I quote, there is no doubt with the construction of these buildings and with their intended use that this will impact the value of the homes in a negative way. <clears throat> uh, while the marine has provided testimony to the contrary from, out of, from an out-of-town company relying on a very small sample size, what I feel, uh, my agent who lives in Kinnaman Port has personally seen, and quoting again from her letter, the decline of property values when buildings and or homes are built that do not confirm, conform to surrounding homes. I mean, if this is not a prime description of, pl of placing this building here, I don't know what is. Um, I expect this will negatively affect the quality of life as well as the resale value of our home when and if we do decide to sell. That's all I have. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else would like to speak? Okay. Hi, my name is uh, Katie Thayer McCammond, and I uh, am one of eight people at the moment that own an abutting property uh, that once belonged to Margaret Hollingsworth. Um, I'm sorry, I'm looking for it. My brother was not able to be here, but uh, wrote a letter which he would like me to read. And then I have a few points that I have looked at, at uh, that have to do with the guidelines for decisions that are involved in making these decisions. And I question whether we have um, satisfied some of those questions. So first I'll read my brother's letter. Uh, my sister is reading this for me as I could not attend this meeting. Currently we're co-owners co -owners of our mother Har Margie Hollingsworth's house and property. As some of you may know, Margie served on the planning committee and the board of selectmen for years because she loved this town and was concerned that uncontrolled and rampant development would destroy its beauty and small town charm. That this project could be built in her backyard would have been devastating and mortifying to her as she deeded a significant portion of her property to the Land Conservation Trust. My concerns are as follows. Number one, by this project, by this project going forward, this would set a precedent that would be the beginning of Log Cabin Road being transformed into Route 1. As we all know, Route 1 goes from the southern point of Florida all the way up to Canada and is just the same all the way up. The storage of fiberglass boats with possibility of 150 gallons of diesel fuel or gasoline in the woods with no fire suppression is deeply troubling. With a volunteer fire department, the response time would almost certainly result in an out of control fire. Like oil rigs that operate with maximum safety protocols, it only takes a one in 1,000 incident to trigger a disaster. Number three, I imagine there will be security lighting if expensive boats are going to be stored there, which would surely cause lighting pollution, wiping out the beautiful starry nights 
I've enjoyed over the years. Another concern as an electrician is the size of the electric service. How big is it going to be? Fourth and lastly, the traffic. When I left the morning after attending the meeting a month ago, I had to wait almost four minutes at the bottom of Fairfield Hill Road before I could turn onto Log Cabin Road. There was so much traffic. Over the last 20 plus years, the traffic has increased greatly. And with this boatyard, trucks and tractor trailers are going to be added to the equation. People seem to drive extremely fast on this road and it's just a matter of time before there might be an accident as the boat is being hauled in or out. To sum up my concerns, I don't believe any of the abutters want this project in this location. I would also be interested to know how many of these boat owners are local. If there is to be construction, I think residential would be much more suitable. That was my brother's letter, not there. Looking at your guidelines for decisions uh, having to do with planning board site plan reviews, uh, 10.10 .10, guidelines for decisions causes for site plan review denial one of those is the proposed use will have a significant detrimental effect on the use and peaceful enjoyment of abutting property as a result of noise vibrations fumes odor dust glare or other cause I think we have a real uh, possible of uh, possibility of of all of those being a problem. Uh, one of the other provisions for vehicular loading and unloading and parking and for vehicular and pedestrian circulation on the site and onto adjacent public streets will create hazards to safety. I'm not sure where the pictures came from of the pictures of Fairfield Hill Road and uh, the intersection of Fairfield Hill Road and Log Cabin road, but Fairfield Hill Road is not anywhere near as pretty as that picture assumes. It's a small dirt road. It is kept up by the town, but it is a small dirt road. It is not uh, ready to be a part of a major intersection for anybody backing up or hauling their equipment. Um, uh, one of the other potential issues was uh, proposed use will cause unreasonable highway or public road congestion. I think that is absolutely without a doubt going to be a problem there. It's already being a problem and if you have large trucks that are stopping, slowing down for large amounts of time, you're going to have cars that are sick and tired of waiting for them and they're going to start screaming around them at 45, 50, 60 miles an hour, somebody's going to get hurt. Um, uh, that's what I came prepared to say after listening to the presentation. I had uh, three questions. One was who's updating Fairfield Hill Road if, if that intersection is going to look as pretty as that and is going to allow people to move in and out. Um, it's a very different picture of reality than what was presented to us. Um, uh, and uh, one other question I had just from the past conversation was, uh, how would you not increase the flow of water flowing over a piece of concrete as opposed to flowing through the dirt and trees and grass and vegetation? I in answer to one of his questions, and I'm sorry I didn't write down what it was, but he was saying that uh, he could control the uh, flood of water would not be increased, and I, I would have to say that I, I can't believe that flood control would not be a larger issue when you have water hitting almost an acre of concrete and moving as opposed to hitting the natural ground surface with trees and roots to control its flow. Thank you. Okay, Steve, would you care to answer any of those things or not? You referring to the stormwater component or? Well, the stormwater, I mean, for some reason she thinks that uh, you're gonna be coming in off Fairfield Hill yeah, Road. Yeah, so we're not doing anything inform to- Inform him that you're not. Yeah, we're not doing anything to Fairfield Hill Road. Uh, that was just a, a computer-generated view from that inter intersection looking at the site. It's not so much what Fairfield Hill Road looks like, it's more the, the rendering was to focus on the building 
and the site, not necessarily the condition of the road. But Steve, in, in fairness, the first um, iteration on this plan did, did have an entry and an exit on Fairhill yeah. Road, and that, that's been eliminated. No, I, I understood that, but I, I think that your rendering is a very simplistic view of what goes on at that location. It's really just a as snapshot. Far as traffic is concerned. It doesn't deal with traffic. It's really just a fo we need focus. But deal with traffic. Is my point. Correct, and we're not doing anything at Fairfield Hill Road. You're, you're, you're saying Fair Hill Road saying generates that, traffic? No, I'm sorry, I'm not. At okay. that intersection, which I am familiar with, sure. there is heavy traffic okay. already, which is a concern. On the right. cabin. And Correct. let's right. since Fairfield Hill Road is only involved in, you can see it. I don't think we really need to be discussing much about Fairfield Hill Road, other than saying, yes, traffic sucks on Log Cabin. I think everybody agrees with that, so. Okay. Um, as far as the stormwater component, um, yes, there is more impervious, impervious pavement, so you're increasing the runoff. So what we have is we have two detention areas. There's one over here, a large one, which is going to capture the, the building, and roughly this portion of the site will go here. In these detention basins, the water is retained. There's an outlet control structure which controls how the water leaves the site after we've had a rain event. Same thing happens over in this location. There's also another structure over there that controls and lets the water out at a controlled rate. Um, so we're not in, there is more so water leaving this. you both of those even though you reduced your sizes? Because it sounded like from what you said that you no longer had to do certain things. We don't have to do the stormwater treatment. So this location here and this Filtera provide treatment for the water. So if you have, you know, any pavement, you get oils from a car or something like that, and if they're doing this top washing, any soaps, as that runs off the pavement, it's going to hit the detention basin and the Filtera, and those treatment systems will treat that water. Whereas if we don't have to do that by code. Well, that's but what I was asking. You but are we are doing that. We are going to do that. We're retain, maintaining that because there was a concern from the neighbors and also from the board. So, okay. Any other uh, people who would like to I speak? I just have a quick question for this. Go, go, ask it up at the microphone, please. Just one quick question. And I'll go. <laughs> and I, I live in 80 Log Cabin Road. My question is. Right here, are you going to put a gate there? So this is going to be wide open to anybody who wants to come in there at night and do anything they want. I don't care about your security cameras. Okay, I understand that. You know, okay? I understand that. But this is going to be an open area now for million-dollar boats and people are just going to be able to drive in. Wouldn't it behoove you to put some kind of gate there or something? I'm, ju I'm just concerned that all of a sudden now, I'm going to see people all over the place. I forgot about the fire suppression system. After I saw on the internet in Indianapolis, Indiana, four, 200 firefighters trying to put out a steel building that took them nine and a half hours to put out. That's all I'm concerned with because this is in a forest, folks, and if it gets flying, I hope it never does because I'll, be, I'll have to get out with my dogs and my cats and everything. And so will all these people here. That's all I'm interested in is that fire suppression system and your security pod. I understand what you're going to do. I understand it's great. You're probably going to be a wonderful neighbor. But I'm just saying this is going to open up. And if you look at Log Cabin Road and you see all the skid marks up and down that road now, it's tough. So people are around at night. I see them. I'm up all hours of the day and night. So I understand what's going on. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Sorry to bother you. Um, I'll, I may let Sean come up and address the gate, but they had not planned on gating this. Um, the, the majority of the boats are going to be in the building. That's really the purpose of this, is to keep the boats in the building. Um, we're, we've cut it back to possibly 11 outside spaces, but again, they're not looking to store boats out there. Um, I think Sean can address that even more. Um, 
not having a gate allows police to come in there. You know, um, I don't know if you want to talk any more about why you don't gate your facilities. I don't think the other boat yards in town are gated. I could be wrong about that, but Sean's saying no, so. Any more comments, public comments? Good evening. I'm still Jack Hunt, yeah. um, and I'm in a butter, uh, and I'm married to Josephine Hunt. It's my real claim to fame, um, and I, <laughs> I'm happy to hear that her recollection that there was a um, burial ground there turns out to be uh, uh, not a figment of her imagination. Um, she would have been here, uh, except that she's too ill um, to attend, and so I'm just here to re say, reference everything she said about it is still, is still true. Um, I also agree with what the other butters have said, but I will not repeat all that stuff because you have heard it. Um, about the idea that the facility is going to be open and not gated, you know, I live very close to that area and I think my problem and perhaps your problem is not going to be um, uh, people really actually trying to steal boats, but it's more going to be like kids finding a nice place to get off the road that's not directly visible from the road where they can do whatever it is that they want to do. Um, but the important thing I came up here for is um, I learned tonight that um, somebody has prepared a report purporting to say that this facility will not negatively affect the value of the, the sale, sale value of the abutters. And I, I have not had an opportunity to see that. I, I do understand it was filed uh, with the uh, board, uh, but it wasn't in the filing that I saw, which was the, the big package that came in a few weeks ago. And I'm very interested in reading that report. Um, in an earlier lifetime, I had something to do uh, with um, real estate valuation. And I, I mean, I question it, let's say, but I'm not in a position tonight to do so intelligently because I haven't had an opportunity to look at the thing. Um, so I'm wondering if um, it would be possible for me to file a letter or something that in a few days after I've had an opportunity to get that report and analyze it um, so I can amplify whatever I think about the report in, in writing. No? <laughs> I, I, we've already extended this thing, uh, you know, and had, like last time, we couldn't present anything because of uh, our standards and such. but. Was that letter, what, I mean, we got that letter from Sebago a couple, more than two weeks ago, or three weeks, three, four weeks ago. It was before the meeting. Before it was the before meeting. the last meeting, yes, the, the aborted last meeting. Yeah, that, that's correct, yeah. Is it in the, the filing that, uh, um, was, yeah, I think it was part of the original email that came in, and typically what our process is, is we just forward on that, you know, we forward on the email that has all of the attachments within. Uh, you know, but more than happy to, to send you a copy or resend you a copy of that if you'd like. Well, I'll take a look at it again, but I yeah, guess so what I'm... I thought someone said that someone of the earlier presenters said they had seen it and yeah. disagreed with it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes. so. Well, I understand the ruling of the chair. Um, I will say that I find it, like, for eight and a half years, I was in the legal department of the Department of Transportation, where quite a lot of our work there was presenting um, evaluations of real estate uh, for the purpose of, uh, unfortunately, for the purpose of involuntarily taking people's land, uh, which is not a very popular thing to do. Um, but um, I don't see how a person with a straight face could come to the conclusion that putting this commercial facility in the middle of this very nice residential area is going to fail to have an impact, a negative impact on values. And it's not really going to answer that to say 
that after 15 or 20 years of growth, it'll be invisible. Thank you. Anyone else? We okay. Matt Wyman, 90 Log Cabin Road. Uh, I appreciate what you guys did here. Addressing my concerns about the entrance. Um, although, in your picture, <coughs> there looks to me like there's some trees cut along the edge here. No? This mature stand of trees is now bushes? Little no, bushes? We're not cutting the trees along the front there. What you're looking at... There's a lot more shoulder there than there is now. Yeah, there's probably more shoulder. But the, the intent is... I, there is to, no trees cut in your plant. There's no trees On the side of the road. There's no trees You've got more of a ditch here than there is on the side of your plant. That's, that's, <clears throat> that's my biggest concern. I saw this up here, and this, that's all pretty with little bushes, little mm -hmm. ditch. It's and that... That shows, okay, but it could show trees out here, not little bushes. That's all I'm saying. We have no intention to cut it. Yeah. Other than what we need to do to put the driveway in. That's the only thing. I would like to be notified if everything goes through. I don't, when there's trees cut, I'd like to be there. There's actually a <laughs> request in if this goes through for okay. a surveyor to come out and define the cut line. So I'd like, I'd like to walk it with you guys. You're, you're welcome to go out okay. and look at the cut. I, you've got my cell number call. Be my guest. You can see the cut line. I mean, that's that. We've actually okay. Well, I just I, define I the cut line so we don't cut something that okay. then considered to be in place already. Right. I thought we were under the understanding. I saw this and I saw this and didn't really match in my mind. But um, also, I'll agree with Alan. I don't think these five trees are going to do anything to protect the view of his house at any time of the year, even 15 years from now. <laughs> That's the shady side of the building. So, I'll just throw that out there. But, thank you. Okay. Another one? Okay. Please. Oh boy, I'm going to need a stool to. <laughs> Does this come down? Yeah. Okay. All right. Hi, my name is Erin Wyman, um, wife to Matt Wyman. Um, so we have a farm located at 90 Log Cabin Road, of which we have some horses at home. Um, and I guess it just makes me nervous, in addition to the concerns of everybody else, not having a fire suppression system. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever tried to work with horses, <laughs> 1,200 pounds of something that can be uncontrollable. But if there ever was an issue, I understand you guys have means to find a fire, should there be one. But I almost wonder if by the time we find one, is it going to be too late? Um, I have one horse that won't load on a trailer on a good day, <laughs> as awful as that is sometimes. I, I know he wouldn't load if there was a fire. I certainly know he wouldn't load if there's sirens and fire trucks and other commotion. I mean, some horses that are even well-behaved and will walk on anything won't load on a trailer in that instance. Mind you, we have three dogs. We have chickens. We have cats. Um, other abutters, I'm sure, can speak to have animals as well that they would have to evacuate should there be an emergency arise. Um, so that's a huge concern. Um, my husband and I are also trying to start a family. And I have a hard time believing that this is the best way to use the land. Is it better used for someone residential who could start a family just like we're trying to do? Um, so it's just, it's just a, big, a big concern. I also hate speaking in front of people, so don't mind me. <laughs> um, on top of that, you know, there's a lot of noise that goes along with installing a building of this caliper. Um, Having three horses, I'm a vet tech myself. I deal a lot with behavior in animals when, you know, if there's stress involved, drawing blood and stuff like that. When we have large noises, it can scare our animals and scare these horses as well. I don't know if it would scare them to the extent of breaking a fence and getting loose on a 45 mile an hour road, of which people tend to go 80 miles an hour on. I have also, I drive a truck and a three horse trailer. I know how it is getting a trailer off that road 
There's no way you're backing a trailer off and it's not what you guys are doing. But it's also hard to even pull a horse trailer off the road. I have to be off quickly and I have people that will sometimes come up close to me with livestock on board that I also have to stop slowly for because they can be jolted forward. I have people that will flip me off and drive around me and, and that can be scary for me as a driver with, with live beings that I'm responsible for on my trailer. And that can be scary for someone who's trying to pass and if I need to move the truck in a trailer a certain way to avoid oncoming traffic for whatever reason. I mean, accidents do happen and sometimes you have drivers that'll swerve in your lane last minute or drivers that'll stop last minute. You know, just keeping in mind that it, it like everybody else has said, it's gonna affect, it's gonna really affect traffic. Um, I feel like I affect traffic sometimes with the horse trailer and I, I don't use it often, but in the times that I do, I mean, it's a scary, it's a scary thing driving a horse trailer on that road. Um, I've driven a horse trailer through New York. I've driven a horse trailer through the city of Boston. I mean, I, I know what it's like to drive in high traffic areas with people that don't understand what it's actually like to have three 1,200 pound animals in back of your truck with a, you know, heavy trailer having to stop that in proper time so that animals aren't in the back of my truck um, out of the trailer. I don't know if you guys have seen pictures of horse trailer accidents, but they're not pretty and in stressful situations they can flail and bolt and injure people that are trying to help because they can't talk. Um, so yeah, just a lot of concerns in addition to the other concerns that were brought up, you know, and living across the road from this area you know, people being around that area when they're not supposed to, even though you do have a security system. That's alarming to me when I'm across the street and, you know, we want to start a family and if there's children involved and, you know, my nephew lives next door to us, there's a child there, there's chi children next door to the property directly, it's, it's concerning. Um, and there's bigger things happening in the world now. It's not like someone gets you know, pushed or shoved, it's people are getting shot, people are getting stabbed, okay, people, enough. it's Thank just you. a little bit more, it's just more aggressive than it used to be, and it's happening more often. So just making sure there's a good security measure okay. involved too. It seems clear to me that the York County Sheriff, who has responsibility for this road, which is entirely in Arundel, entirely in Arundel, it's not in Kenny Bunkport, seems the York County Sheriff is really not doing his job on that road. No. I can't drive more than 40 on that road. I'm sorry, I get a lot of people angry with me, I admit. But <laughs> if I go more than 40, I say, geez, I'm going awfully fast on this road. There's no shoulders. There's no shoulder? Why does the sign say, why does the sign say Kenny Bunkport side and Arundel side? Right at the I, I don't know why the sign says that, but it's wrong. Okay. Okay, the, the, line, the line is on, it's, you know, a few feet to the right <laughs> as you're going up the road, but yes. But it seems, anyway, I can't obviously control the county sheriff. <laughs> Do we have any more comments? I, I guess not. Good. Oh, I'm sorry. I have a child here. Uh, you, you, if you have a, a comment, you, you put it up there, please. I'm sorry. But. I'm Diane Wyman, and I'm at 104 just up the road. I have a child care, and I own both sides of the road, you know, both mm -hmm. ones. So we are on the Arundel side. Yes. Across the street is the Kennebunkport side. Yes. If I have a question, or if I have a problem and I'm on the Kennebunkport side, sheriff won't come. If I'm on the Arundel side, Kennebunkport won't come. Kennebunkport takes care of the Kennebunkport side of the road. Okay. And Arundel takes care of the Arundel. And it's the same way with the RSU. If, if I have a child across the street, the RSU, Kennebunkport, will pick up, not Arundel. Arundel will not pick up a child from across the street. If I have a Kennebunkport child, the Kennebunkport bus will not pick up on the Arundel side of the road. I have to cross the road well, they're going in order for the Kennebunkport to bus to stop. So the town is, that road is divided. Yeah, I, I know. I agree. No, I'm just saying. Yes. Okay. Uh, I have a question. Okay. Sorry. I 
again, I'm, uh, you know who I am. <laughs> um, again, reading from the planning board site, plan review, general requirements, et cetera. Um, one of the requirements, performance standards uh, 10.7, uh, let's see, I'm past A, I'm on to B, B, I, acceleration and deceleration lanes should be provided where the volume of traffic using the driveway and the volume of traffic on the road would otherwise create unsafe traffic conditions. Have we looked into this? We're talking about very large trucks stopping and taking a lot of time to turn, slowing down, that takes them a long time to slow down. Um, right now, that road does not have the ability to, I don't believe, to give you acceleration or deceleration lanes, but it looks like that's part of um, the performance standards for this lot requirement. Um, what section are you in? 10.7 performance standards B I. Uh, page, well, I don't know if you have pages. 10 7. 10 7, yeah. I says that acceleration and deceleration lanes should be provided where the volume of traffic is, using the driveway this and the is volume. That's parking lot. That's parking lot considerations, it says. Well, they're driving into a parking lot, are they not? Vehicular entrance and exit parking lot. Is aren't they driving into the parking lot of the facility? Good point. I'm just saying. It's another point that I think. I, I'm I'm just in general. I feel that there are a lot of guidelines for your decisions that I don't feel have been adequately addressed. Thank you. And that's one of them. Thank you. Thank you. Can I respond to that? Yes, please. <clears throat> um, part of the application is we are on a state road, um, so this does have to be reviewed by DOT um, for a per entrance permit. And so they look at that, they look at the road condition, they look where the driveway curb cut is, they look at the traffic volume coming in, and they actually look at stormwater too to make sure, you know, is this gonna work? And they, they have been out there, they looked at it, and they have signed off on it. So um, this is a low p impact use as far as trips going in and out of it. You know, we got, you know, boats, I think Sean talked about maybe three per tide if they're even going to this facility, so it's not a, a a high volume facility that requires a, uh, a pull off lane or deceleration lane. It's not that type of a use. If this was a big trucking terminal or something like that where you got a lot of vehicles or a big parking lot, a Walmart, that's where they get those uh, acceleration deceleration lanes. The majority of the boats are being pulled with a pickup truck. I mean, I think there might be scheduled one boat across the back, so five. Sorry. <clears throat> We're picky about microphones. Thank you. Sorry. One thing I would add to is, again, we, we're talking about 30 boats. They come out in the spring. They go in in the fall. Majority of them are pulled with a Ford pickup truck that's our own. There's probably going to be five boats in the back that would require a fifth-wheel truck. Um, same schedule. They're going to they're gonna swing in, pull in. We're going to back up into the building, close the door, set the thing down, and the truck leaves. It's somewhere usually between... 8.30, 9 o'clock, when everyone gets to work and gets moving and gets to the site, puts it down, and usually by 3.30, everyone's made a plan to get home. So I think we're going to be off peak hours. Uh, the boats are all still in the water. Most of the, the tourism season's gone by, so I, I, I understand it, but we're, we're literally talking about five, maybe fifth-wheel loads going in once a year and maybe five coming out. I think that's, that's a reasonable number. So those, those trucks and trailers are currently already going up the corridor, and the sooner we get off it, the less pressure we're putting on that road the rest of the way. I have a question for you. Please. Um, there was obviously been a lot of concern about fire, and I mentioned a question before. So as an owner-operator, do you identify just this if you get it and the bid for property, or do you own other boat storage 
or marinas, or manage other people's as a as your company? Uh, the answer is yes to all of it. Um, we we do this the 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 building square footage. I've been through it with Cumberland, Yarmouth, Falmouth in the past. This square footage, this usage. Um, I've never even been asked to put the early warning system stuff in. You're, we were asked to consult the uh, fire chief in town. He walked the property. He asked for a little more setback for equipment and turning radiuses. We provided what he wanted. He asked for the oil warning system. See no reason not to. It's a good idea. Um, we have uh, just recently finished a building in Biddeford at that other facility. It was an 8,000 square foot profile. Um, City of Biddeford's gone through, and, and they were sticklers. And, but no requirements for... Um, for early warning systems, no requirements for cameras, no requirements for fire suppression systems in that facility, and there's another 8,000 right adjacent to that on that property that was already existing, um, and that one's not even a steel structure, and uh, again, nothing. And when they looked at the usage and how we load the boats, and they, they went in when it was loaded, they talked, they were complimentary of our aisle spaces and the, the way we load the buildings and how we provide space and the lighting and the door <laughs> usage. Um, We've had a lot of compliments on it. Okay, um, so you've never had in either owned or managed any fires? Never. N never had to. I know with the crew we have to go do some like basic fire extinguisher training and things like that with them so that if something should occur, that hopefully they could deal with it in short. But I've never had a fire in my own experience, and I've been working on boats since I was a little kid, the family boatyard. Thank you. Yeah. So just to get it straight, Steve, you're not going to have fire suppression. You'll only have the detection. Correct? There, there is not a fire suppression system. No, no sprinkler. No so uh, but are you going to have, like, those handheld uh, dry chemical type fire extinguishers? I would assume you would. Fire extinguishers in the building itself. At every exit, at every door, sign, yeah. stickers, lights. Okay. That's all required. And the, yeah, great. Uh, okay. Fire chief will have keys to the to the building to get in if the alarm goes off. Yes, he required a knox box. So. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, I'm going to uh, close the public hearing and thank you for all your inputs. And now I guess we have to start deliberation. Question, Steve. Did did okay. did 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 a police chief have any view on this? There's been a number of concerns raised tonight about access and uh, I haven't heard security. Any, I haven't had communication with the police chief. Uh, mostly everything was around the fire chief. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't know if Warner's had any discussions with him, but I have not. Um, I know that you know the marina does visit their facilities. They run very clean facilities, and I got to believe if they start having vandalism, they're going to be on it. And you know, that's just the way they operate. And if you're familiar with their facilities in town, you know, they don't want to have problems for the neighborhood. Either. Obviously. I think we're going to have to go through the 10 tens mm -hmm. along the way and kind of figure out where we are. So this is only, we don't have the added feature because there's no, R, no RP or uh, curl. Correct. Yep. Go ahead. Start with B and work our way down. A is the generic. Well, well let, me, let me just co comment on A. It, A is the one that says you've got to meet, meet the regulations. Meet the right? regulations. And, and it seems yeah. to me that uh, where this is a conditional use, we should uh, focus on 
the specific uh, requirements in the ordinance for conditional uses. Okay. Right, so it's in, in uh, Article 9, H. Yeah, conditional uses. 9H, there we go. Yeah, so this is Board of yeah. Appeals. Ones. Yeah, that's in, uses yeah, that I'm sorry, this is yeah, that's part in to it. There's a similar appeals. one for us. Yeah, so you're in I'm in the wrong section. Yeah. So you're in <coughs> Article ten. So if you were looking for a location in terms of what to, you know, what to go through. Yes. So we don't have a, so we don't have a specific, you know, there's not a specific list of performance standards. You know, like some uses will have, you know, have a separate subsection, you know, that has uh, very specific conditions for that particular <coughs> use. So this doesn't, uh, this doesn't have those. Mm. Uh, but so I think where you would, where you'd start would be in 10.7. You know, in terms of the performance standards, uh, the performance standard piece there, and that's where some of the reference, um, you know, the references to the parking, uh, parking lot were in, uh, were in Article Ten Seven. You know, that goes through, you know, so uh, Ten Point Seven is one that deals with your performance standards piece. So I think if if you're looking at trying to answer your questions for A, other than the general zoning guidelines, such as you know building height, lot coverage, uh, those types of things, right, right. yep, that are in just the just in the general zone. And I, I don't have a concern in, for those. Yeah. In nine uh, H under conditional uses, that's where it talks about character uh, and existing use of the neighborhood. But this. That nine section is for the Board of Appeals just conditional appeal. use. Yeah, that's just Board of Appeals. Yeah. Planning Board conditional use. Yeah. Gotcha. Thank so you. I, would, I would suggest that, you know, if you want to go, you know, you could take 10.7, use that to assist you for, you know, um, A1A, you know, yeah. and then the rest of those, and then the rest of the sections, B, C, D, E, you know, I think, yeah. I think what you'll probably find is that, you know, as you go through... 107A that'll answer some of the questions in 1010A1 through the rest of the letters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, Bye. that makes sense. Thank you. Right. I mean, the erosion control is already one of the regular items. You know. In that that's right. Yep. You'll want you'll you'll find that. Uh, you know, for instance, you know, even, even if you start with, you know, 107A with your erosion control piece, you'll wind up answering that question. You know, that, that'll help you answer. 10, uh, 10 whatever. Sure. 10, yeah, yep. whatever it is. 1010A1J. Mm -hmm. yep. You know, it'll answer that. So if it's helpful, I mean, I can I can read through the section, and then the board can just, you know, have the discussion, you know, and respond to that if that's helpful. For which the for the ten ten, 10 seven yeah for ten, ten seven, seven. 10, 10, 10, 10. seven yep yeah so yeah so ten point seven so what we're reading from is ten point seven performance standards. Uh, 10.7A is, is titled Erosion Control. Right. 
So uh, erosion and sedimentation control plans shall be developed so as to ensure that erosion of soil and sedimentation of water courses and water bodies will be minimized by employing the following best management practices. Uh, A, stripping of vegetation, soil removal and regrading or other development shall be accomplished in such a way as to minimize erosion. Uh, B, the duration of exposure of the disturbed area shall be kept to a practical minimum. Uh, C, temporary vegetation and or mulching shall be used to protect exposed areas during development. Uh, four, permanent uh, final veg and mechanical erosion control measures in accordance with the standards of the county soil and water conservation district shall be installed as soon as possible after construction ends. Uh, and e, until disturbed area stabilized, sediment and runoff water shall be trapped by the use of debris basins, sediment basins, silt traps, or other acceptable methods. So that would be, you know, looking at a plan and, you know, have they given us a, mm -hmm. uh, an ENS plan. Um, top of a cut or the bottom of a fill section uh, shall not be closer than 10 feet to an adjoining property unless otherwise specified. Um, G, during grading operations, methods of dust control shall be employed uh, wherever practical. Seems to meet that. Mm -hmm. okay. So as you all have in the past, and, and I'm just offering this up kind of as a reminder of when you've dealt with applications that, you know, that you're looking at mm -hmm. uh, pretty closely. Uh, typically what you've done is you've essentially you've pulled, yep. you know, you've pulled the board uh, in terms of yeah, assisting Ed uh, with drafting up a set yeah. of findings. You know, so I think yes. that, you know, I think that process is consistent with, you know, what you've done on some other projects, and I think that would probably be helpful here. I agree. Right. No, I agree. Yep. No, I was wondering if we wanted to go through the other 1010s first, just to be, you know. Sure. Because the conforms with everything in the world question is obviously the hardest. But, That's right. Uh, yep. You know, there might be two or three other ones that we can't come up to an yep. agreement on also. Yeah. Okay. So. So, if we just look at B, 10, 10 A, 1 B, right? Pros. Well, the fire well let me let me let me back you up. Okay. Sorry. You know, so you know the first so A1 is A1A, you know, and I think this is you know just a question for you all to to ask is the proposed use. Uh, does not meet the definition or specific requirements set forth in this ordinance or will not be in compliance with applicable state or federal laws. And so again, your process has been to deliberate on those specifically and right. make a determination as to whether or not um, you know, what your position is on that <coughs> statement. Right. Which is where you were headed with uh, the 10-7. You got it. Yep. Mm -hmm. So. Well, well let, me, let me just feel like we're, we're dancing around this. Yeah. We've had ample opportunity to review the package. We've gone through several iterations of it. I don't know of any item that is being questioned right now as not being in conformance right. yeah, with right. a specific uh, item article of the ordinance. Other members of the board, am I? What am I missing? Is there anything contentious? It's not too tall. No. It's the parking is fine. Stormwater management. So, DOT has so approved the access. Can can we can we agree as a board? Can we pull the board to say, do we believe that item A one A is is met? Su subject to exposure of something else along our deliberation. But well, what about buffers? What about buffers? Yeah. Okay. We we get on that done in D. Yep. You right. To answer so, that question so that's in D. that's why I mean you know. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay, so, so your I'm, preference is to postpone A because well, you think it's going to potentially uh, be impacted by the other ones. That was my, and I'm that, fine with that. That was why I was kind of heading towards why don't we start with B. <laughs> All right. 
Okay. Because B is a, is a question. I mean, it's still, you know, as they pointed out, a, uh, you're talking about 1010B? 1010A1B. Okay. Proposed use will create fire safety hazards by not providing adequate access to the site or the buildings for emergency vehicles. No. Well, certainly, the fire chief likes the access to the vehicles. So mm -hmm. I think that one is. In fact, his suggested modifications were incorporated into yes. the plan. Mm -hmm. Correct. So I, I, for one, would say that, that 1B is met. Yes. Yeah. I would agree. Everybody? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Exterior, exterior lighting will create hazards to motorists traveling on adjacent public streets or inadequate for safety of occupants or users of site and or will damage value and diminish usability of adjacent properties. I don't think it's going to be lit up that often. So. Uh, I think that's met. I think that is met. I would agree. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll turn my page. Okay, now here's the buffers. Provision for buffers for on and on-site landscaping do not provide adequate protection for neighboring properties from detrimental features of development. Well, that's the first one that is certainly interesting. Mm. Okay, so so what are the can we can we list the detrimental features? What what constitutes a detriment, <coughs> de detrimental feature? Uh, I guess they're talking uh, visual, <coughs> visually detrimental. The building, is that right? It's, uh, but what else? Potentially. In terms of that specific one, I can't say the. They, they talk about uh, maintaining uh, <coughs> vegetation, adding plantings, adding yep. mounds, or berms. Uh, <coughs> so they, they've added plantings with the intent mm -hmm. of minimizing the visual impact. Uh, and it also says that uh, in 1C, uh, that buffers shall uh, be sufficient to shield structures and uses from the view of non-compatible abutting properties and public roadways. Uh, so that part of the question is, uh, does the plan uh, adequately do that? And their plan is to maintain uh, existing trees, primarily deciduous, and to plant uh, uh, on both sides of uh, the Fairfield Hill Road and Log Cabin Road to plant uh, deciduous, excuse me, uh, coniferous trees that they say will take 10 to 15 years to grow. And then also along uh, the side of the building uh, to uh, add to the uh, uh, the visual impact on uh, the house in the back, I believe, is the Lovejoy house. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Right. Which has 140 plus, 120 plus 40 feet, and then the additional plantings. Do we think that that's adequate? As outlined. If, if you think that the detrimental features of the development are its very existence, as some would offer, yep. then no, it's not adequate. It doesn't put them out of business. It doesn't make them disappear. But if it is to make a conditional use uh, compatible with, with uh, this, this farm and forest area, I think it's gone to great lengths and to me seems adequate 
to uh, make it blend in. It, it's not a rock and quarry gravel, guys. I mean, it's uh, it's a vote storage. So, so 10, already 10 yes, D I understand. B C say the buffer should be sufficient to shield structures and uses from the view of non-compatible abutting properties. In this case, the non-compatible abutting properties are homeowners. Are homeowners. Homeowners. Residential, residential. homeowners. It's yeah. a residential, residential community. Or a farm across the street. Right. And, and whether, whether or not, it sounds to me, that whether or not a, uh, a commercial use alongside an existing residential property is not a decision for this board, but it's a decision for the appeals. Is that correct? And no, changing no. the character. Well, I mean, the problem, we're somewhat constrained. The, uh, the, the reality of farm and forest zone is regardless of sounding like it ought to be farms and forests, you can do most anything yeah. in the farm and forest with conditional use approvals from either the ZBA or from us. And so, you know, I think as Ed pointed out, it's, it's the mere existence, you know, they have to take that up with uh, the voters of the town that and, you know, try to change the... Uh, Definitions in in the uh, land use ordinance. So this this is an allowed conditional use. Yes. Yes. A conditional use is a structure or a use which is generally inappropriate without restrictions in a given zone, which, if controlled as to location, size, and off-site impacts may have no adverse effects upon the public health, safety, or welfare. That, that's what we're talking about here. Yep, right. That's the essence of the argument. The only structures or uses which shall be permitted as conditional uses are those listed as conditional uses in Article 4 or specifically described as conditional uses in other provisions of this ordinance. And it is an allowed conditional use in, in the table in, in Article 4 as they're talking about. So, so really it's... We've had a lot of discussion about how there's a better use, a, a, a more preferred use. We'd rather have it be a residential structure. That, that's not something that the board has any purview over. Right. Really, this is, isn't an allowed conditional use that has been uh, restricted in such a way as to not have adverse effects upon the public health, safety, or welfare. And I think we need to look at the items in 1010 A1 in, in that context. Yes. Okay. So are we still on C? Or? We're on from D. I think we're D. talking about D. 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 Okay. And, and, and that has to do with I, the buffers. I think that it has. Has. I think there. Um, I mean, I thought, I thought the, uh, the changes have really made this into something that Again, I'm, I'm not particularly taken with the looks of the gravel operation that's just up the street. It's an allowed conditional use, but uh, this, this would be a lot better neighbor for me than, than that. Uh, yeah. And I think, I think they've done, in, a, done, I think a, it's a, done a good job. A pretty darn good job on that. Of not affecting adversely right. health, safety, or welfare. Now, can we conceive of a situation where there was a fire? I mean, yes, I, I think we can. I think you've gone to the fire chief and and worked with them and, and worked out an acceptable plan to, to minimize that. Is it zero probability? I think not. And the same is true of every residential structure that, that's in that area as well. I don't think we can, can drive that number to zero. We can just drive it to what the experts in this area say is, uh, is acceptable and what experience with the other facilities uh, that we know of uh, says is acceptable. So on, on D, in terms of the buffer, no. we, do we think that that's been adequately met? I, I do if it's maintained. And, and I do think there needs to be some language in the findings about the Maintenance fact that of. this isn't a we plant it and we leave. Um, you know, it needs to be maintained and it, it needs to grow that in, in, uh, so, so that it is consistent with the vision. That include replacement of, of trees. If something I believe it does. Okay. 
Okay. Yeah, sure. Warner, isn't that already in code? Like, code enforcement already has that, that we have to maintain the property anyway. So we don't have so we don't have a property maintenance code. You know, I think um, it's a common misconception. You know that uh, that folks have. Uh, you know, we have had circumstances where uh, where buffering has hasn't survived. You know, and applicants, property owners have been made uh, to re replace you know buffers that you know that haven't survived. You know, where there's been die off. You know, and. And that's been understood as a condition that runs with, you know, that runs with an approval. You know, if there's the expectation that a buffer be planted, the expectation is that the buffer is maintained and that it's, you know, that it be kept alive, that it's not a, you know, one and done, and if it dies, oh well. Uh, well what we typically try to be sensitive to is we don't, we don't have a code enforcement police department. Um, you know, that goes around and inspects once a month to make sure that no trees have died. But that I do think we could put some and should put some language in there that says that uh, it, it needs to be maintained and if it's brought to the attention of the code enforcement office that it's not, that then uh, action will be taken. That's good. I'll work yeah, with you no, on that's fine. You know, I mean, I... You know, I have no. Do a make work project for I mean, I have no issues with you know with you having language in there you know stating that you know buffers as presented on a plan are required to be maintained. Yeah. Yeah. I mean so that's simple as that. Yeah. I mean that's, that's a. Good. Okay. E. Proposed use will have significant detrimental effect on the use and or peaceful enjoyment of abutting properties as a result of noise, vibration, fumes, odor, dust, glare, or other cause. Yeah. And I think once it's built, I don't see there's any issue, and I'm not really sure how you how you think about enforcing something like that during construction. It seems that doesn't seem enforceable during construction. Yeah, I mean that's you know that's a situation with any you know with any residential project as well right. is that you have a period oh, of yeah. time you have a period of time where there is you know there's no doubt there's impact oh, yeah. you know to abutting property uh, owners. Um, and blasting you know, I mean, Wilds District Road lately. So. That's right. <laughs> yep. You know, know. blasting projects. Uh, you know, have you know have temporary you know that you know dis In general, disturbances I think with folks. The uh, once the once built, I don't see that any of those are, are problems. And in, in terms of activity on the site, they're saying thirty boats being stored, and yeah. they can do three per tide. Right. And so that that amounts to probably two weeks in and two weeks out. T yeah. Typically moved, though each boat moved twice a year. Yes. Although right. and, and on exception, if there was a hurricane, and then, perhaps an additional transition. But, so, but then, right. then uh, and, and people on and off the site, I'm sure, from time to time checking on stuff, but that's a, someone coming up during daylight hours. Okay. Highly seasonal. Yeah. And, I, I, again, I don't see much there. F, the provision can, for can, can we just confirm for my oh, own sorry. purpose that we, are we saying unanimous on, on, uh, on D unanimous and on e? e? I think so. Yes. Okay. Thank yes. you. Okay. On F. Provisions for vehicular loading and unloading and parking and for vehicular and pedestrian circulation on the site and onto adjacent public streets will create hazards to safety. Again, the number of boats. You know, the fact that there are wackos on the road is a you know, fun, <coughs> intriguing point that doesn't really have anything to do with the boat towing. And I think you've got the Department of Trans uh, Transportation weighing in that says, it's as far as we're concerned, this is okay. Yes. And it's their road. Um, yeah, was that on the on the most recent revision, <coughs> Department of Transportation? It was something I emailed to Warner, <coughs> the actual approval from DOT. It came yeah. this week. Yeah, that was on this. But that was on yeah, this most recent that. revision. That's right. Okay, thanks. A revised. Yes. Revised yes. approval. <coughs> okay. so, so I'm okay with... Okay. With, mm -hmm. uh, F. That was letter F. Yeah, letter G. Mm -hmm. Anybody else okay with and that? Everybody's yes. good with uh, okay. F. Yeah. I think we're all good with F. 
G, proposed use will have significant detrimental effect on the value of adjacent properties, which could be avoided by reasonable modification of the plan. Mm -hmm. That's the uh, key sentence here. Mm -hmm. We have two realtors coming up with dueling, which, yes, it will, no, it won't. I'm sure I can find two more and get two more opinions. Uh, but Well, one is not a realtor. We do have a letter similar from a realtor that counters uh -huh. Lovejoy, but there was no facts with it, so we didn't submit that. It was just an opinion letter. Yeah. <clears throat> so, you know, the I believe you've made many of the reasonable modifications of the plan already to minimize any such issues. So. Well, well, that's that's right. Th th this provision or this paragraph. You know, starts on the from the premise that the plan is valid, and so the question is, are there any reasonable modifications that haven't been made and they, yet? And they did them, and they seem I to have done, done the reasonable modifications. The reasonable one, yeah, point. yeah. Again, I'm, 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 I just feel obliged to say that that uh, the, the argument that I'm hearing as a board member is that there would be a better use of this land than a commercial property, and and. We're not in a position to, to make that happen. G given that, you know, the reasonable change is isn't to make it go away. This seems like uh, we've tried to, to to accommodate. They've tried to accommodate all of the um, specific concerns to the degree mm -hmm. that it can be done and still be a boat storage facility. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't see any way around that. Well, and, and then, of course, as you said earlier, the, the farm and forest uh, zone specifically says a conditional use uh, subject to site plan review as a boatyard. So I mean, it's, like, it's right here in black and white. So. All right. Okay. So I'm okay with so G. I, everybody okay with G at yep. this point? Yeah. H. Design of the site will result in significant flood hazards or flood damage and is not in conformance with applicable flood hazard protection requirements. I don't think that's a problem. I don't think that's, that's an that. issue. Mm -hmm. They've done a good job on that. Okay, everybody? Yes. Okay. I. Adequate provision has not been made for disposal of wastewater or solid waste for the prevention of ground or surface water contamination. Again, I think they've done. Yes, it's got a septic yeah. system. Very good, good. Yeah. Properly designed. Uh, yeah. Okay. J. Adequate provision has not been made to control erosion and sedimentation. I think we have. We have. Seen. Mm -hmm. It is a part of the plan. Yeah. Yeah. Are we good? Yes. Okay. K. Adequate provision has not been made to handle stormwater runoff or other drainage issues on site. Again, I think there's. Done a good job there. Solid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. Oh, everybody agreeing. Yes. Proposed water supply will not meet demands of proposed use for fire protection services. And the uh, fire chief seems to think we're fine. Agree. It's town it. water? Yes. Okay. No, it'd be a yeah. well. A well. It's a well. And, well and you found funding. the well adequate? For the, for the, for the uh, domestic use, you know, just the... For fire protection. They would bring in their fire trucks for that. In other words, th there's not a water source on the site that the fire department would use to fight a fire. The closest hydrant is around there. I think there's one right on the right on the road, just past Lovejoy. Isn't there like a pond with a hydrant pickup right there on Lock Avenue? There could be. But that's how they would fight a lot of the fires in the farm and forest. Is they do it with their pumper trucks. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> um, yeah, I don't know Okay, so I guess we're fine. So the typical the practice fire chief would be to bring, like the, the fire chief would, would be to bring a tanker. <coughs> yeah. Mm. Okay. Adic M. Adequate provision has not been made for transportation, storage, disposal of hazardous substances and materials as defined by state law. I think that's N.A. Yep. Offhand here, because you're not doing the boat washing, the underside boat washing, right? Which item was this one again? The M. M. <coughs> Adequate provision has not been made for transportation, storage, disposal of hazardous oh. substances. You are actually doing that. 
with those catch place basins, right? Not in this. No. I wouldn't say they would fall into that. Not we are providing, that's what they're doing, but it's not hazardous waste that they're doing. No. Yeah, you're not no. generating hazardous they're not, waste. They're not right. generating any hazardous yeah. waste. Correct. That's right. We, the, others, the other boat we heard Did. was. Yeah. And yeah. took care of it. Yeah. Okay, so I think that becomes an NA. Yeah. I bet you like that NA. Yeah. I would agree. Okay. Yeah. And the proposed use will have adverse impact on significant scenic vistas or on significant wildlife habitat, which could be avoided by reasonable modification <coughs> of the plan. Yeah. And I think it's NA. Well, I think, right. Of course right it's done. Yeah, that's okay. NA, then. Proposed use will cause unreasonable highway or public road congestion. Too few trips a year to be unreasonable. Well, again, the DOT has signed off on it. And the DOT has signed so off on it also. I'm good with it. But we have to sign off on it, too. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. I'm just saying, to me, that's <laughs> that was important to hear. Right. Are we in agreement here? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. P, existing off-site ways and traffic facilities cannot safely and conveniently accommodate the increased traffic generated by the development as far away from the development as effects from the development can be traced with reasonable accuracy. DOT uh, is approved. I can I'm not. I don't see it as being a big generator, that's all. Off-site ways, I mean, there's just the little parking lot. Uh, well, there's other ways to get to from Kenny Bunkport up to Highway 1. Well, yeah, right? but, but no, that's not the... And this isn't going to have so, inconvenience. There, there really isn't much increase, so I really... It's either exactly. an A or, just, or yes. I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's not a problem. I read this to say that, that, that group, group 9 and surrounds cannot safely and conveniently accommodate the increased traffic generated by this new site yeah and I'm, I'm not seeing that yeah no so I don't think that's a problem no okay <coughs> and that's it other than the, back to the uh, the well-known proposed use does not need a we didn't really vote on a proposal proposed use does not meet the definition or specific requirements set forth in this ordinance or will not meet be in compliance with applicable state or federal laws. And we've already got state approvals and on it, and federal isn't mm -hmm. And it relevant. does meet the definition. In fact, boat yard is written into the ordinance as a conditional use. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. I think so I'm is, good I'm with it. is okay. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so I think you've got your, uh, your FOF, <laughs> that piece. So, so would you entertain a, a motion I to would. to approve this application? Yes, please. So moved. Second. In favor. Sorry, folks. <laughs> well, sorry to everybody. Yeah. Uh -huh. Thank you. I think we heard it. Yeah. Conforms to the requirements. Okay. Next Thank item. Thank you, Stephen. Is another public hearing. And. This is really neat. This one is really cool. You ought to help mm -hmm. see this. Yeah. It's really neat. This house bag. So, wow. anyway, we're looking for item 190702, Peterson Design Group Authorized Agent for the existing two family dwelling and rebuild. Why don't we wait on, for just uh, a second? If, I don't Village I, residential, shoreland, and I residential. Can't even, I can't hardly hear you myself, Tom. Okay. Who's the case manager on this one? Who's your gal? Sorry? Do you know the case manager is on this? No. David, have you been here long? I don't know if there is one yet. Is there? <laughs> Here's David. I There's thought you always yet. watched this on TV. Oh, and took notes. Oh. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, to this one. So this is uh, num number two, yes. Main Street. Yeah, that cut, yeah. It's like a triple glass. Yeah. Okay. So. Hi. Hi. I'm Eric Peterson from Peterson Design Group. Um, okay. I know that last time I was here, I explained the basic premise of our uh, application for the project at 2 Main Street, a reconstruction of an existing uh, two-family dwelling. Okay. 
Okay, so this is a survey that shows the existing property, uh, which it's, uh, there's not a lot of land there as far as the upland area. And a butter here that's interested in seeing the... She can hold it. <laughs> Thank you, Abby. This is Abby Troiano. She's in the butter who lives next door. Um, so currently there is a two-family uh, dwelling on the property. It's uh, up and down right now. There are three living levels. The first unit is the main floor and the ground level floor, and then the second unit is the second floor. There's additionally a cottage, a freestanding, just barely freestanding cottage. That's not an independent unit, um, but it's uh, living space. So, and this is the this is the existing driveway. There's an existing old stone retaining wall that we intend to keep as part of the more of like a landscape feature as part of the new project. The big thing here is the main house and the cottage are both in the flood zone now. The the main house, the lower floor. Uh, Elevation is at elevation 7.55, which currently the flood elevation for that area is 9. And so the FEMA requirement for living space would be 11. So we're way, way below the flood elevation. And it actually has flooded a couple times in the past few years. In fact, the, uh, Paul Henderson is here. He's the, the owner along with his wife who's not here tonight, but she was here last time. Um, when they purchased it, they, they were told that it had flooded and you can tell that because when you go in the lower level, that's the grade level. I'll show you the back elevation. The floor, the, the tile floor is all buckled because the slab has been undermined and it looks like tectonic plates shifting. So structurally, it's not sound. Um, Flood-wise, it's just a bad situation. I can't imagine that anybody would want to keep their house in the flood zone if they, couldn't, if they could avoid it. So what we're proposing is Removing the structures completely, keeping the stone retaining wall, constructing a new two-family home that is all up at the street level, so what's the middle floor of the current building. Um, the proposed fl uh, uh, flood elevation for, actually the proposed flood elevation for this, it stays the same. Yes, we're, we're, the proposed flood elevation would need to be at 11.75. We're proposing the first floor of um, the first living level of this building would be at 16.5, which basically relates to the sidewalk more than anything. So it'll be open underneath on a pure foundation. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then this part of the this part is a two-story uh, unit, and then there's a one-story connector, and then a two-story what looks like a small barn. So we tried to keep the aesthetic of what's there so that it's a good contributor to the neighborhood. For those of you not familiar with the property, this is what the front looks like now. This is the street side, which literally sits on the sidewalk. This is the side, if you're looking at the side of the building that faces Abby's property, it goes down a whole story, drops down to the, to the water's edge. And then this is the side that faces the cove. So there's quite a bit of glass on that side now, a lot of you know five picture window units. And then the bottom, the part that's closest to the water is a big screen porch. And then the wall of the house is, is set back from that. That's so. not glass though, those are screens. Those are screens, right. that's right, yes. So <clears throat> this is the side that faces the intersection of North Street and, and Main Street, existing conditions. These are the floor plans of what's there with existing area and volume. What is, the, what is the total square footage? Total square footage of... The old. Yeah. Total 
Total square footage, interior square footage, living space of the existing house is 3,040.36 square feet. And we're proposing to build 2690.5. And the volume of the existing structure is uh, 30,210.16. We're proposing 24,459.88. Um, another wow. important. Um, Hundreds of cubic feet. Yeah. But, well, that's, <laughs> that's okay. That's Warner okay. wants volume and area calculations, <laughs> so we deliver. It's <laughs> the beauty of CAD. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> so the lot coverage right now is 48. 0.9%, so 48%, 41% in the upland area, which is above the 7, the 7 7.1 high tide line. <coughs> so we're obviously only building back in the upland area. We're building back 36.17%. So it's smaller in every way. It's smaller in lot coverage, smaller in area, smaller in volume, um, smaller in, in um, footprint. Right now, the existing uh, buildings are 77 feet wide and 58 and a half feet deep. We're building a building that's 76 feet wide and only 36 feet deep because it really hugs the road. It's in the most, it's in the least non-conforming spot of the lot. Does it, do any of those calculations include the impervious surface to the dri existing driveway versus the proposed two driveways? For sure, it's shoreland zone, so that's this is takes into consideration all impervious but surface. Does it, does it, do those, the, the coverage, is that including the driveways? Yes, that's all. Everything that's not green. Mm. Yeah, it wasn't the first okay. calculation. Same. It's the same standard in both cases. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. How about the height difference? Height difference is almost the same. It's within a foot of, of the height that was there. It's something like 20, 25 or twenty six feet high as as it relates to the average original grade that was set on the survey and the the standard for that area is thirty feet. So we're trick. we're well under. Pardon? It's like a magic trick. Yeah. Well, <laughs> how'd you do that? Yeah. So, Abby, have you seen the plans for the <clears throat> proposed? <clears throat> so this is the proposed elevation facing Main Street, and we really wanted it to be an homage to the existing house that was there um, in scale and shape and size, because it's kind of a familiar building. Nobody likes change, and so we want it to be better but similar um, with the addition of the what looks like a little carriage barn would be the second unit. And um, if someone ever wanted to use it as one unit, this link connects to both sides. So it could be one oh, single family home if someone wanted to use it that way. Um, so let's see, lot coverage is down, volume is down, area is down, height just about the same, um, much more conforming on the lot, uh, meets all the flood restrictions, um, is no closer to the street than the existing building was. Um, what have I missed? You're saying the front setback still isn't met. It, it's definitely not. It can't yeah. be. There's no building envelope no. on this lot. No, it's, because you're you're showing landscaping there on the left, right? Oh, is that there is? You can landscape in front of the building. Really? Yeah. We okay. do. We do propose. We do propose that there's a landscapable buffer. It's not big, but you know. Perennials or something well, like that. Or, or, or no, I mean, you know, what's that? One bush. Yeah, it's the width of a bush. That'd be nice. They are flower boxes right now. One, yeah, one in the middle. That's right. So this is this shows you the this is the front edge of the house right now. This dotted line. So we're proposing that the closest point, which is only the width of this room, is no closer than the existing house, and then it steps back from there and it continues to step back. Um, so we're proposing that we have four parking spaces as is required by the town, two per unit. And so we've split it up. It used to be that all the parking was on one side of the lot in kind of a kludgy shape that was hard to use. So um, we've cleaned it up and met the minimum parking requirement as far as square footage to keep it nice and clean. So there are two spaces on the right-hand side that would serve the right-hand unit and two spaces on the left-hand side that would serve the left-hand unit. Parking lot on the right-hand side of this drawing, you're shifting it down a little bit to the right. What happens to the existing buffer that's there? We would, yeah, we would intend to plant a buffer there because we certainly want to screen from the neighbors, you know, for your benefit. That would be a new buffer or the existing buffer? Well, the existing is kind of just messy, to be honest. It's kind of just an overgrown 
It's, it's is it like cedars, I think? Cedars, or? and they're on, they're on this property? Yes. I think, they, the I think they are, they okay. probably spill both ways. Okay, they're yeah. long there. Yeah, I would think that the Hendersons would probably want to tidy that up and maybe do a arborvitae, you know, edge or something. You know, you know the, the house in Kennebunk, um, when you go around the rotary on Fletcher Street, Right, headed out of town. Someone built as a there's like a bed and breakfast, breakfast right there, mm -hmm. and there are two driveways right next to each other, and they've got kind of an evergreen arborvitae line. That's kind of what I envision. So, uh, with the drawing for the proposed for the plan, uh, you have the driveway. It looks like right up against the line. It's pretty close, but we so can. Is there room for a, a we can make there? space for that to happen. If you look at that, that doesn't really take much, like a couple feet, to okay. to make that happen. So we'd make that happen. The other, the other side is the Say again. The other side is the driving parking lot as well. Right. Yes. Right. So the good news is for the abutters, you don't have all the parking right up against you. It's tailored now, so it's two cars, you know, end to end. But certainly the I know the Hendersons and, and certainly I would want to make sure that everybody's protected that way. Full disclosure, we may have designed a house for Abby and her husband a long time ago, so <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> That's true. So we'll uh We'll make sure that, that everybody's satisfied. There were concerns raised at the last meeting regarding the uh, amount of glass. And we have addressed that. Okay. <clears throat> well, the amount of glass in the with birds. Yes. 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 And, and also a, a dramatic increase in glass, it seems, over the existing house. Glass and screens that would add to light. <clears throat> So this shows the we were just talking about the one facade that faces the yes. faces the uh, mill pond, mm -hmm. and what I've done here uh, we've done a whole ton of research because this is the first time the bird question has been applied to our projects, um, and so I've, we've educated ourselves on uh, bird safety, and what we're proposing is that every window you see that is yellow would have a screen on it, which is an established way to uh, eliminate bird strikes. And what that does is cuts down the amount of contiguous glass areas. So the remaining glass areas are individualized mm -hmm. and they do have grills in the, in the windows. So there, we have covered more than half of the, by percentage, more than half of the, of the glass on that facade is covered by screens. Um, some of it's also sheltered by railings. Some of it is set back. Um, well, these are outside screens. Outside screens. That's the only way it would really work. Yeah, yeah I know mm -hmm. that. I yeah. mean, the staff case on windows so can't open the screens. Inside. So they're yeah, right, exactly. Difficult. <laughs> yeah, you know, we looked at the idea of doing some in swing windows, but those don't meet egress. So yeah, sure. in bedrooms, we need to meet our egress code. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, um, like I said, we, uh, we've done a lot of research, and it seems as though sort of the, the most sensible way to, to mm -hmm. uh, satisfy the, the requirement for the birds um, is to do screening. So we've done as much screening as possible on, on as many windows as possible. Some, a lot of these are sliders, so you can't have a screen on both sides or else the door doesn't work. And they're, they're pretty small spaces, so in-swinging doors really don't function. Um, we also, just as a practical point, we, we uh, took a rough measurement across the water to the nearest point where there would be trees, and it's about 200 feet away. So, the closest I, spot. well, directly across yeah. from these windows, yeah. if you scale it on Google Earth, there's a little tool you can use, yeah. and it's about 200 feet away. So, I guess I would say that it's not like there are trees right next to the house that are reflecting on the glass. The trees that the trees that would cause the reflections that would encourage the birds to fly into the windows are 200 feet away across a body of water. Yeah. So. Can I can I just ask? Do, do you could could you share uh, any of the research that you did? Yeah. Well, Who, um, do you have the articles, for example? Well, so that Ms. We... Perlmutter gave me a whole bunch of stuff yep. to read, which I did, and I and I spent some time online looking as well. It's I mean it's kind of crazy when you see all the things that you can do to prevent bird strikes. You can string monofilament line in yeah, front yeah. of your windows. They recommend you soap your windows, which kind of defeats the purpose of having a window. <laughs> windows. Um, yeah. But um, applying, you know, applying uh, decals to the windows, mm -hmm. 
but actually one of the one of the recommended ways to address it was to do screens because the screens just cut the cut the ability for them to see a reflection and you're saying one of the articles that Nina gave you advocated that as a solution you know I can't say that it came exactly from one of the articles she gave me but so if you could just share that article that would be helpful you don't have to do it right this minute but I could forward you the article I read online that talked about the value of screens as a bird yeah. strike deterrent sure yes yeah that, that, that would be wasn't that, that part of the solution that would be helpful on Ocean Avenue yes. Say so again. Part of the solution on Ocean it, it Avenue was, was screens. Yeah, I, I just think that calling it a solution is is too strong. Okay. I, I think it's a mitigation. Okay. Well, any of these uh, things are really mitigation. Th th issues. That's right. And, and here we're not screening all of the windows, as we said we were doing on Ocean Ave. I just want to comment, and I can't pretend to speak for Nina, but I think if she was here, she would say that birds fly to the sky, and these windows are going to reflect the sky and the clouds and everything else. I don't think the Proximity of trees is the uh, sole discriminator here. Although that is the point that she made last time. Yes, it is. Yeah. Uh, and there is literature on that. There is literature. They see. They think they see a tree, see a tree, and so they go to land on it, and. Which I can forward somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. I just I, remember reading about the UNE facility that they've done. The, it's could a could you point building. out? You said there were railings and yep. balconies and overhangs. Can so you point out where they are? There's railing here. And I know, I'm sorry, it's small. This is railing. This is railing. And this is on the north side of the building, for what it's worth, so it's not going to be like sunny skies reflected in the windows necessarily. I know I'm trying to splitting that hair, but um, it's not going to be the most. They've done something to mitigate it, which is important. More than 50% of the glass on that side of the house will be covered by screens percentage wise. And the balance actually have probably the crosses in them. So they do, and the and the way the screen uh, pattern works, you don't have big expanses of glass unscreened. You know, at the proximity to screens are always next to. You know, if there's a, a window without a screen, something on either side of it has a screen. So there's not like big. It's actually better than what's there now, which are five picture units, picture window units, with no screens. So what? So what's the experience with those large plate glass windows that are there now? Do you, you have a lot of well, bird fatalities, or have you noticed anything? They have not been reported. None have happened. But we used to Okay. All right. So okay. might not be that big of a problem to start with then. Hmm? <coughs> might not be that big. Of we a didn't problem. recognize the problem, but we're trying to respond to the right. concern. Okay. So. Okay. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Do we have copies of the the? the plan? Uh, I can take. You can enter this into the record if you want as your copy. I, I think we want to update the plan in some fashion to yeah. to say this is what you're going to do. That's it, all. If you like, I I made a notation on this back elevation that says the yellow shaded areas indicate screens, yeah. which yeah. I'm willing to contribute this to the file if you want. If that's the. I think that would do it. And if you put a note in your. <clears throat> Yeah. Findings of fact that the mitigation effort includes to refer to the drawing with the yellow screening. Okay. Perfect. Good. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Any more from those guys? Nope. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any? Any? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. just I, I signed myself, and in my, my notes say that I'm the assignee. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> Thank you. And, and by the way, the minutes said it was Ed, and it was me. I just noticed that. Oh. <laughs> Chairman, do what you want. But if he wants to do it with doing the other one. No, no. Oh, you, you got the fun one. Okay. There'll be another one. Good. Okay. Um, so I will open the public meeting. So any public that wishes to speak? Dave. Of course. Giving Dave a microphone, of course. That's... Yeah, I'm Dave James, and I happen to live right across Mass Cove from the subject house on the Old Bourne property. We own 14 acres there that abut Mass Cove up and down that side of the cove. And talking about birds, uh, the Canada geese are back, and I counted 72 of them in our front yard <laughs> yesterday. And the ducks are now coming back from the river back onto the Mass Cove. So. The birds are migrating back. Uh, I had a question about the parking lot. Uh, you've got a parking lot on either side. Mm -hmm. Are both of them side-by-side -side parking, or is one of them front and back? The 
one to the right of the house from the street is front to back, and the one to the left is side by side. So how does that mean you have to back out one car before you can get the second car out? If you're in the tandem side, you need to do that, yeah. yeah. I, I'm concerned. That's a very, very busy corner, and of course, mm -hmm. during three or four months of the summer mature season, traffic is backed up solidly there coming into town, mm -hmm. and oftentimes coming out of town. So just something, and that's an issue for the DOT to deal with, not I not even me. suspect that someone might do what I do. Uh, I have a truck, right? Yeah. So my habit is to back in everywhere I go because it's much easier to get out. That's true. It could very well be that. But people, stopping and backing in in that corner is. Well, you get really good at it. You just. Uh, you're right. in. <laughs> you come down there sometime on, I've, I've when the traffic the down. Uh, so, so where this street is is Main Street. Is it, isn't that a, a Kenny Bunkport Street rather mm -hmm. than Route Believe Nine? Or not, it's, it's Route Nine. So it's yeah. uh, it's a DOT. DOT. That's not the, Route Nine. Yeah, that, that section isn't Route Nine. Yeah. Yeah, that part of no, it is the actually Main Street. Street. Oh, North no. Street comes out from the post office, and oh, no. they join Main and North the, School Street. Nine, so it's not Main. Main. Yeah, I, <coughs> I, 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 I right and go up right School Street. Main. Right and go up School Street. Street. Yeah, he's the left. That's what I wanted to hear. So he right on the sharp yeah. corner. So regardless of whose street it is, it seems like traffic control in town is is under the concern and purview of the police chief. What did he think? He okay. totally passed I mean, the, the buck because he said it was on, not in his purview. He doesn't care. He said he had no opinion on it, and okay. it was a DOT question. Well, uh, we have a concern about uh, lighting There's that stays on all night, and I'll let my wife speak to that because she's more knowledgeable about that than I am. And the other thing, your comment that it's 200 feet <coughs> from the tree line to the back of the house, I would question that since I know where those trees are. In fact, I was down there this morning putting some fertilizer down around it. And it may be 125 or 150, but I doubt that it's 200. I just, well, okay, so I, I, my, my caveat was I relied on Google Maps, which has a measuring tool, which I just, honestly, I did it in the back row here as I was waiting. But Google Maps don't show the trees, do they? Yeah, you want me to show you? <laughs> no, 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 I'll, I'll. No, I'm happy to show you, honestly. Uh, I, will, I will check out, okay. drop your pin, you, that's the measuring tool, right? Yeah. So you put where you want to measure from, right? And then you add a point, you drag it, and we get the trees close to 200 feet. Right, because we have trees okay. right on there the edge. Besides Dave, yeah. it seems to have gone so 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 under yeah, Okay, maybe. <laughs> All right. Well, if we rely on technology, it is. Yeah. Dave, okay. more comments. Usually, I've recognized Barbie, someone else because you guys were busy. No. Uh, okay. <laughs> sorry. Thank I'll you. I'll turn it over to my other half. <laughs> my concern is uh, I'm with San James. I live with him across the cove. <laughs> um, there are in-ground lights that light facades of buildings. And this is a building with a lot of glass on my side. And there are lights that are spotlights that are on buildings that light the bushes and the water and whatever. That's a carnival to us in the summer, in the winter time. Oh, on the building currently, you mean? No, if you do that, oh. if they do that, we will have a carnival in front of us <clears throat> in winter because we'd have no leaves. Right now, it's pretty covered. We don't see much of anything. And the house lights, that's okay. They're spotted in the neighborhood. This is a sweet, dark, old neighborhood. Very friendly. And a used car lot or uh, looking like a carnival. I'm worried about that. I would be worried about that too, which is why that would never happen there. Well, is this a rental property or condos? Not condos. It isn't. Although that's not. But who's ever... Who's ever in there can install anything they want. Well, the Hendersons they? own it, so. Yeah, but they, they could highlight it or they could downlight it. And that's right. I mean, our bedroom is right there. Well, that's my objection. Okay. Well, it, can, you, can you unpack that a bit more for me? Is it an objection or a concern that you'd like to have sensitively addressed? <laughs> I don't know. 
I, I don't want to see lots and lots and lots of Because I haven't there. suggested something to object to, to be fair, right? I guess I'm objecting to what I would consider extreme lighting of a building. Or, or the, anything in front of it. I'm with you there. I, I haven't seen any lighting proposed for that. For no, the honestly, the, the only lighting that we would, I, I'm going to go out on a limb here, Paul, but I mean, I don't, I don't see this as like some lit, lit up spectacle. It's a, it's residential lighting, right? Talking about a lamp by the door and well, that's yeah, fine. yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I think we're on the same page, honestly. Totally agree. Yeah. There's not enough landscape there too. too. <laughs> so well, I, I, you, you I agree. I better. agree with you. Well, what I what I'm entertaining one yet. No. What I'm hearing is a concern that that lights not be played out over onto the mill pond either, yeah. right? And uh, to illuminate the sky to make to make it a spectacle. Huh. Which really isn't isn't helpful to bird life either. So yeah, small. sea they'll turtles be, and all that jazz, right? Can, um, Lure them up on top. Oh, they'll be right up on shore, yeah. <laughs> I think we're all on the same page in spirit. So I, you may I, see something in the, you know, conditionally that says residential lighting. I think only. that's totally <clears throat> fine, don't you, not, Paul? Not directed out onto the pond. I do. Yeah, yeah. There, there is some spotlight there now underneath the, underneath the jazz, and I, I have yeah. a way that I've got to turn off. So I guess I'd say that if so, you... Like, it's not desirable. If there were to be residential sort of like, you know, spotlights like the two light thing, we'd make sure that they were shielded so they didn't spill. Right. It's a pretty it's a pretty open corner there, I'm not gonna lie. I mean it's you can see no, it no, from all sides. Absolutely yeah. right. Yeah, and there's car headlights and this everything else. I know we're not gonna go make it uh, turtle uh, friendly, but No, and it uh, won't be a used car lot either, so yeah. No, no carnivals. I know, I kinda it's not zoned for that, so Okay. Festive. <laughs> Any other? Uh... I just have a couple questions. Okay, thank you. So I am Abby Triano. I live at 4B Main Street. Um, so construction. Mm. Um, it's required. Mm. Yes, I know. <laughs> and and deconstruction. <laughs> so uh, that's definitely a concern on that corner with no parking. Well, so what has to happen really is deconstruction right? right yeah and then staging area we would right. use the we're, our intent is to use that left-hand parking area as a staging area okay so and so and the buffer thing the whole buffer thing so I'm assuming yeah. that on that side Your you're side. gonna take that down the messy that, bushes that bu yeah well and it's messy on both sides so I would like to work with you guys on that it'd be great to meet at the property and we could mm -hmm. figure out where the line is and yep. well you know. it was just surveyed so the pin should be pretty fresh okay good um so yeah so the vegetation on that side um that side is has been a concern also if you go down over that retaining wall there's a lot of old growth like trees with a lot of that really shield us from that property i don't think we actually intend to do anything down there because it's Pretty close to the water too so well i didn't know about the dep if you, if certainly you, had you can't to... just go and like strip it clean that's okay. not gonna work because it would be really i mean it really covers and we would love for that to be left if if so kind of to the right of the cottage um so if you're looking at the mass cove mm -hmm. it would be to the so just down between, over the hill between our house and, and the cottage, and the cottage. So yeah. yeah paul do you agree that you'd want to keep a buffer on that right hand side Absolutely. Yeah. And you know what? Beyond that retaining wall, Abby, you can't do anything there. It's just no, it's no, no. Just These down trees, hill, though, so. are uh, you know where that retaining wall is? Yep. They kind of start there, but they go like you know, sort of. Yeah. My yeah. instinct is that we want to plant that edge so that both parties have some privacy. Okay, perfect. <laughs> That's good. Um, I, because it's in shoreline protection, I think if you take them down, you have to replant something. For sure. I mean, yeah. and, and then, uh, it's always nice to add stuff. Yeah. You know, to add. Yeah, but I mean, you can't just take trees down next to the water. Right. right. That's right. Um, and drainage and runoff and how it, we just want to make sure that's not going to impact our property. It, it's actually less hardscape, less square foot of hardscape near you than it is now because right now there's a whole parking area, you know, 1,200 square feet of parking that we're replacing with 400 square feet of parking. Right. So that should be an improvement. Okay. 
And so I'm assuming that the, you're going to live there, but is that second unit a rental unit? Could be. It's two. It's a two-family unit, so just like right now, it's rented. It's uh, a rental unit. Yeah, we know. <laughs> so... I guess I, it's, it's, that, the zoning is a two-family unit right now, and it's going to remain a two-family unit. But. Okay. All right. Those were my questions. Okay. Thanks. I have one other, one other question for you. Okay. I don't avoid private conversations. Or Sorry. When, when you demolish the existing house, yeah. the house, in, in fact, kind of retains the soil other than where the retaining wall is because you have the house there which is retaining the soil behind. At the street? Between the street, yeah. Yeah, there's actually a big granite wall there. Is there? Mm -hmm. Under the house? Yeah. So yes. that granite wall will stay there. Mm -hmm. Yes. There is actually no foundation. It's the street wall this, that holds this is like, so this is the sidewalk? Right. And bolt next to the sidewalk and kind of below it like if you could see down yeah th through the house this is a big stone granite chunk wall you know okay so that's what's retaining the earth from falling back down exactly because you can walk okay. right like if you're standing up here i'm standing right here a whole story below you yeah five feet away to down a whole story walking in here okay good enough mm -hmm. okay any more public comments Okay, so I'm going to close the public hearing. Um, now, what's the DEP situation on this? Do you have? We filed our permit by rule more than 14 days ago, and we haven't heard nothing. So by default, it's approved. Okay. Mm -hmm. It was filed before the last meeting. All so. Right. Well, do they ever actually approve it anyway, even if it's? Well, it's a permit by rule, so the. <laughs> If they don't call you and ask you for additional information or tell you you are otherwise not approved, it's approved. Okay. That's the nature of a permit by rule. Yeah, it, it, okay. it's the opposite of how any other permit works. You may you have know? already got. They may have already sent it to you. I don't know by now. If you don't, yeah. typically, you know. So. And then, like once a month, they yeah. save. Uh, they save all the permit by rules yeah. that they've done, and once a month, they send a batch to the prospective towns right. that they've been approved to. Okay. So, Le so Lisa gets like a bunch that yeah. have. All right. Fine. Yeah, they're just they're the opposite of how mo you know most municipal permits work. Where if you don't hear anything, it's deemed denied. In the permit by rule case, it says as Eric stated, you don't hear anything in 14 days. It's the opposite. It's deemed mm -hmm. approved. Yeah. Wow. It's a little yeah. blind, but wow. okay. Yeah, and yeah, yeah we will typically we'll get you know we'll get notification, and you know I mean it may be you know maybe three weeks you know from now that we'll get a you know we'll get a, a an email that'll have a bunch of permit by rules in them. That's why I always have Toby up at, at DEP in Portland date stamp my ap applications when I bring them in so that yeah. we know exactly when the 14 days starts. Mm -hmm. All right. So, any uh, more questions from us guys? And I guess at the last one I made myself the uh, case manager, so... Uh, um, do you need a motion to approve? Yeah, we do. I'll, I'll, I may actually do that myself. I'm going to move approval. Ah, ah. Second. Okay. <laughs> all, all those favor? Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So uh, there will be, we will read the uh, finding effects the next time. And it's five minutes of ten, and we haven't read that. I, I, well, if I never, I knew I'd never get to yours. I just really didn't think I wouldn't get to Jim's either. But <laughs> that's the apple, apple blossom, and really, okay. Hey guys, it's five minutes to ten. Do we, do we start? Start that long view thing or not? I think we ought to read the findings of facts. I think we ought to read the findings of facts and just put Jim first thing. Go take a nap. Sorry, Jim. But <laughs> no, it's just as well. I have a girlfriend that walked off into the emergency room. She's going to go there. Okay, works well. Very good. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Okay, so. It's still no farther. 
So we are going to have items five and six will be the first two items on the next uh, next meeting. And in fact, the rest of our we've cleared the rest of them off. Yes. Wow. That's very good. So we'll just have those two plus whatever else. Well, pretty tough ones too. Yeah. I think I think Jim had more than one coming together. Yeah. Hmm? The next 18th. meeting is two weeks from today, on the 18th. Yeah. <coughs> so, okay, can we, we, we will now read the findings of fact for 190401 Henry Family Trust. And we give, give the mic to you. Folks, uh, please be quiet. We are still in session. Okay. Okay, so... This is the application of Christian O. Henry and Krista P. Henry, trustees of the Henry Family Trust, established June 3rd, 2004, at, uh, for 22 Ebbs Cove Lane, Kennebunkport, Maine, to install a 4-foot wide by 16-foot long access ramp to a 4-foot wide by 60-foot long fixed pier into Turbot's Creek to a three foot wide by 33 foot long seasonal gangway to a 20 foot wide by 10 foot long seasonal float. The total assembled length will be approximately 116 feet. Following a site plan, <coughs> sorry, sorry. <coughs> following a site plan review pursuant to the Kenny Bunkport land use ordinance held on May 15th, 2019, continued on June 19th, 2019, and continued on July 17th, 2019, and the final public hearing held on August 7th, 2019, the Kenny Bunkport Planning Board makes the following findings of fact and conclusions and renders the following decisions subject to the conditions enumerated below. Finding of facts are as follows. The applicant is Christian O. Henry and Krista P. Henry, trustees of the Henry Family Trust, established June 3, 2004. The applicant with a mailing address of 411 Walnut Street, number 12346, Green Cove Spring, Florida. The applicant has authorized Ambit Engineering, Inc., Ambit, to act as agent in this matter. The property has a street address of 22 Ebbs Cove Lane, Kenny Bunkport, Maine, 04046. The property is located in village residential and shoreland zones. The owner has demonstrated a legal interest in the property by providing a warranty deed dated September 16, 2018 and recorded September 25, 2018 in the York County Registry of Deeds at Book 17807, pages 944 to 949. The property is legally conforming and consists of 1.8 acres, more or less, in a residential structure. The property is located at 22 Ebbs Cove Lane, Kenny Bunkport, Maine, 04046, and is identified as Map 21, Block 9, Lock 52B on the Municipal Tax Assessor's Maps. In an application dated April 23, 2019, the applicant proposed to construct on the property a four foot wide by 150 foot long elevated walkway, a four foot wide by 60 foot long fixed pier into Turbis Creek and a three foot wide by 35 foot long seasonal gangway and a 20 foot wide by 10 foot long 200 square foot seasonal float which supports one end of the seasonal gangway. In an amended application dated June 10th, 2019, the applicant proposed to construct a four foot wide by 16 foot long access ramp, a four foot wide by 60 foot long fixed pier into Turbot's Creek, a three foot wide by three foot, 33 foot long seasonal gangway and a 20 foot wide by 10 foot long 200 square foot seasonal float, which supports one end of the seasonal gangway. There was a proposal to construct a four foot wide by 134 foot back bark pathway, but this is not part of the proposal and therefore not before the planning board. The proposed access ramp, fixed pier, gangway, and seasonal float had an approximate total assembled length of 116 feet and thus does not comply with land use ordinance 5.11.B.15, which provides that any accessory residential pier, walkway, dock, or wharf, including ramps and floats, shall be no longer than a total length of 100 feet. As part of this amended application, the applicant did not request a waiver or modification of the 100-foot length requirement and did not submit any evidence to demonstrate that no other reasonable alternative exists to provide water access from the lot. 
In a second amended application dated July 9th, 2019, the applicant proposed <coughs> to construct a four foot wide by 16 foot long access ramp, a four foot wide by 60 foot long fixed pier into Turbots Creek, a three foot wide by 33 foot long seasonal gangway and a 20 foot wide by 10 foot long 200 square foot seasonal float. There was a proposal to construct four foot wide by 140 foot long bark pathway, but this was not part of the proposal and is not before the uh, planning board. The proposed access ramp, fixed pier, seasonal gangway and seasonal dock will extend approximately 45 feet, well, 17.1%. 17.11% beyond the mean high water line in Indu Turbots Creek, which measures approximately 263 feet across from the same point. See the revised permit plan seat sheet C1 dated July 8, 2019, note 12 for reference. This meets land use ordinance 5.11.B.15 requirements that the total length will not extend more than one-fifth of the way across the body of water. The proposed access ramp, fixed pier, seasonal gangway, and seasonal dock has an approximate assembled length of 116 feet and does not comply with land use ordinance 5.11.B.15 requirements as stated in paragraph 8 above. Applicant proposed several alternatives for purposes of demonstrating that there are no other reasonable alternatives than the proposed four foot wide by 16 foot long access ramp, four foot wide by 60 foot long fixed pier into Turbis Creek, 30, sorry, three foot wide by 33 foot long seasonal gangway and 20 foot wide by 10 foot long seasonal ramp to provide water access from the lot. The property and proposed access ramp, fixed pier, seasonal gangway, and seasonal float are located outside of the velocity zones, as shown on the most recent flood insurance rate map produced by FEMA. This meets land use ordinance 5.11.B.1 requirements. The proposed access ramp, fixed pier, seasonal ramp, and seasonal float are not located within the habitat of a threatened or endangered species as mapped by either the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife or the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. This meets Land Use Ordinance 5.11.B.2 requirements. The proposed seasonal float measures 20 feet wide by 10 foot long, which is 200 square feet. This meets Land Use Ordinance 5.11.B.3 requirements. The applicant and property have approximately 130 feet of shore frontage. This meets Land Use Ordinance 5.11.B.4 requirements. The proposed access ramp here, seasonal ramp, will be located no closer than 30 feet from either the northerly abutter or the southerly abutter. This meets Land Use Ordinance 5.11.B.5 requirements. The proposed access ramp and fixed pier will be a minimum of one foot above the ground as measured from the beginning of the ramp. This proposed deck, the proposed deck boards will be no greater than five and a half inches in width and will be spaced one inch apart. This meets land use ordinance 5.11.B.6 requirements and any reference with respect to deck boards being spaced one half inch apart is interpreted as a minimum spacing requirement and not an exact spacing requirement. The proposed access ramp, fixed pier, seasonal gangway, and seasonal float are not located within an existing development or natural beach area. This meets Land Use Ordinance 5.11.B.7 requirements. The proposed seasonal gangway and seasonal float will be in place on a seasonal basis and stored outside of the coastal wetlands in the upland or off-site or, or off during the off-season. This meets Land Use Ordinance 5.11.B.8 and 5.11.B.16 requirements. The surrounding area is developed with both residential and commercial structures, including docks associated with those structures. The proposed access ramp, fixed pier, and seasonal gangway will be four feet or less in width, and the support pilings for the proposed pier will be located approximately should be 15 feet apart. This meets, I'm going to modify that. This meets Land Use Ordinance 5.11.B.9 requirements. No lighting is proposed for the project. Land Use Ordinance 5.11.B.10 is not applicable. 
No structures proposed to be built on, over, or abutting the proposed access ramp, pier, seasonal, seasonal access ramp, or seasonal float. Uh, so land use ordinance 5.11.B.115.11.B.13.14 are not applicable. The proposed project is located in Turbots Creek, a tidal water. Land use ordinance 5.11.B.12 is not applicable. The proposed access ramp fixed pier, seasonal gangway, and seasonal float will be used for recreational purposes. This meets land use ordinance 5.11.B.17 requirements. The proposed access ramp fixed pier, seasonal ramp, and seasonal float is not an enlargement, alteration, repair, or the rebuilding of a nonconforming pier, dock, walkway, wharf, ramp, or float. Land use ordinance 5.11.B.18 is not applicable. The proposed access ramp fixed pier, seasonal gangway, and seasonal float has an approximate assembled length of 116 feet. This does not meet land use ordinance 5.11.B.15 requirements. The applicant has demonstrated a modification or waiver. The, land has re the applicant has not requested a modification or waiver of the 100 foot total length. Requirement is set forth in set forth in land use ordinance 5.11.B.15. The applicants have received approvals from the main DEP and the Army Corps of Engineers. Pursuant to the requirements of Article 10.10.A of the Land Use Ordinance Guidelines for Decisions, the Planning Board shall approve a site plan application unless it makes a negative ruling on one or more of the following identified findings which would otherwise compel denial. The proposed use meets the definition or specific requirements set forth in the land, set forth in the land use ordinance and will be in compliance with the applicable state or federal laws. The finding is no. Comments. Land use ordinance 5.11.B.15 provides that any accessory residential pier, walkway, dock, or wharf, including ramps and floats, shall be no longer than a total length of 100 feet. <clears throat> the planning board. Okay, the planning board may, upon review, modify the length requirement if it is demonstrated that no other reasonable alternative exists to provide water access from the lot. The proposed access ramp, fixed pier, seasonal gangway, and seasonal float has approximately a assembled length of 116 feet, and the applicant has requested a, has not requested a modification of the 100 foot total length. Uh, I'm totally confused at this point. Well. Exactly. We're going, that's where we're going. So let's, I mean, we can't approve this finding facts because it doesn't make any sense. Okay. Does it? Does it make sense to you? I, I, I thought it made sense when I read it, but what I just heard you say uh, is that the, the applicant they, did not. But they did request well, they, a waiver. For a they, waiver they did and request. They did, and we said no way. Okay, all right. Okay, so the applicant requested a modification of the 100 foot total length requirement. After review of the applicant's second amended ma application and proposed alternatives, the planning board does not approve the applicant's modification, modification request of the 100 foot total length requirement. The proposed location of the access ramp, fixed pier, seasonal gangway, and seasonal float are such that it must span a freshwater wetland, a shore marsh between the high water mark and the land and extend into the flat bottom area of Turbots Creek, which results in the total length being over the 100 foot total length requirement pursuant to land use ordinance 5.11.B.15. Currently, the applicant has water access from the lot. As a result, the applicant already has a reasonable alternative to provide water access from the lot, which results in the request to modify the 100 foot total length requirement being denied. Based on the board's negative finding with respect to the article 10.10.A.1A, the board understood that the failure to comply with land use ordinance 5.11.B.15 and thus article 10.10.A.1A compelled denial. As a result, the board ends its deliberations and did not discuss any further articles 1010A, B through P or articles 1010B, A, 1A through B. Conclusions. Articles 1010A of the Land Use Ordinance mandates that the Planning Board shall approve a site plan application unless it makes one or more identified finding, findings that would otherwise compel denial, and as noted above, the Board does make such a finding that compels denial. So the site plan application identified above is denied. So I did, I did make that merit. I, I did uh, insert that word not, and it he did. Yeah. But they requested the... They did request the and, it, and it and it was denied. Yeah. Yes. So this is correct. Okay. This is correct. Okay. You, the, you were, you were going to make an 
inline change. Yes, I was going to make an inline change. But there is an no. inline change at the fifth, the 16 feet. It's got to be 15 feet on paragraph 18. Okay. Must have missed it. Because that is the rule, right? The, the piers have to be 15 feet apart. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I don't remember. It is 15. What are we referring to? Are we, uh, we're the, referring to a the, property the, line? The, the, the distance between the piers on a gangway, 15 feet. Oh, I see. As far as the actual piers, you know, the piers themselves. Yeah. I mean, that's more of a, <clears throat> I mean, that's more of a performance standard uh, component piece. Well, yeah, yeah, I believe that's yeah. 15 feet. Yeah. 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 15. Okay. So I'm going to add, so that's not, so, all right. So, are we all right? I, think, I guess. I mean, I'm... Okay, take a look. Well, it's just that the, when you read it, it confused the hell out of me, so I'm not <laughs> sure that it's the best thing to That's produce. That's what we get for doing it after 10 o'clock. Right. No. I suppose. I, I read the draft he sent around. So. Yeah, I'm sorry, yes. I, I missed that. I, I, but I missed, it, this I is correct. The 15 to 16. Feet. This is yeah. correct. This is correct. It's got, the 16 has got to be 15. Okay. Because we don't do rejections real often, so it's nice to be really clear. So, uh, okay. somebody needs to uh, oh, sorry. move approval of the uh, okay. thing she has read. Sorry. So, I move to approve. Second. All right. In favor? Thank you. <laughs> Got to do it right. Got to do it right. Yeah, sorry, yes. No, we okay. need to sign it. No, do I need to yes. initial? Yeah. Uh, the yeah. Sign it. Yeah. I'm probably in a black pen, so I'm going to have to borrow a pen since mine's red. Um, I just want to read that one side. I'm sorry. Scarf got Scott's. Yep. They did request the waiver, but then we denied it. Okay. That's what is the point. Has requested mine. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Oh, the second one in front of me. Yeah. I was wondering where it went. Are we off? No. Uh, no, well, no, we, we're still, we're still signing, but we could, we could adjourn, I guess. First. Yeah. Motion to adjourn. Second. Those in favor? Okay. Thank you. We're off. <laughs>